It's the second and last Sunday of the Newport Collegiate Baseball League regular season as the playoff pitcher starts to come into fruition. Thomason's Zverell alongside George Bissell here on the Newport Collegiate Baseball League broadcast network. And George, we had two games on Friday night, the last time that these teams played. Both these teams both went in extra innings and had some exciting baseball on hand on Friday. That's right, and for Kettlebottom, they've locked up that number one seed. They're going to be the top seed throughout the NCBL playoffs, which are going to begin next week. Looking forward to that, and we got a pair of excellent left-hand pitchers going here this afternoon. Should be a good one. Both of these teams look ready to go. Oh, you mentioned the two pitchers on the mound. Will McFadden will be taking the hill for Fishers Island. Going to be an incoming freshman in a college just like Ty Healy as well. Healy will be incoming freshman at Merrimack College as McFadden will face this kennel bottom lap that goes as follows. Jake Goss in the third baseman will lead things off. Wearing number seven, followed by Christian Beal, the center fielder. And Matt Woods, the right fielder out of Bryant University. Kevin Cyprian, the catcher. Jarvis Christian, Alex Lynn leads the league in RBIs in the five hole, followed by Will Panarello coming off back-to-back -back home run games, one Thursday and one Friday. Eric Ramirez is the extra hitter tonight, usually in the shortstop position, but gets the defensive day off. Nate Vigen at second base, Braden Dolbazian batting ninth, playing shortstop, and Josh Gilmart playing left field, gets reinserted back into this lineup. And you just have to know, the one through about five, maybe now six guys in this lineup. It's a very deep lineup for Kettlebottom. Yeah, it's been one of the premier offensive teams in the league. The pitching's been electric as well. So Kettlebottom's formidable. And let's take a look now at the Fishers Island starting lineup set forth by the head coach, Frank Holbrook. In the leadoff spot, the shortstop, Spencer Smith. Batting second, the third baseman, Addison Kopak. In the third spot, the second baseman, Jake Coro. In the cleanup spot, the extra hitter, Billy Butler. Batting fifth, the center fielder, David Meach. Batting sixth, the extra hitter, hitter Liam McGill, batting seventh the first baseman Jared Groskuff, left fielder Blaine Litsky bats eighth, and catcher is Rob Butler batting ninth. In the tenth spot is the right fielder Anthony Ramos, starting pitcher Will McFadden out there on mound has completed his warm-up tosses. He'll be making his fourth start of the NCBL, seventh appearance overall, 0-1 with one save in 13 and two-thirds innings of work. His an ERA just a shade over five. He's allowed 11 runs, eight of those earned on 14 hits, 19 strikes, Strikeouts, only five walks for McFadden out of UMass Amherst, who stands six foot seven, 220 pounds. So the tall lefty is ready to go, and we're set to get things underway here from Cardians Field. Uh, definitely an overpowering feature for McFadden. The 19 strikeouts, definitely something to watch out for. Man, it's McFadden from the lineup. We'll face off against the third baseman, Jake Gustin. First pitch. That's club on the ground. On the ground to Groskoff at first. He'll toss McFadden. It'll be a 3-1 put out. First pitch at 103 Eastern time here in Newport, Rhode Island. Excellent reaction there by McFadden coming off the mound. Now he's falling away to the third base side of the rubber. So he has to go a long way to make that play as Groskoff kind of gets caught in between whether or not he should take it to the bag or flip to McFadden. So heads up play there by the pitcher to get over and cover the bag. Sometimes on the first pitch of a game, you're not ready to make a play, but McFadden was uh, ready that time. As Christian Beal takes ball one, game time temperature 77 degrees, 11 mile an hour winds blowing out from the south. Again, not far from the water here in Newport. Really anywhere in the city as the 1 0. Beal hits that one on the ground, past the outstretched glove of Addison Kopak and trickles in the left field. And Christian Beal collects the first base hit here for Kettlebottom. Not a lot of extra base power this summer for Beal, who comes in 12 for 44 on the summer. He has walked five times. He's stolen four bases, so he's a threat to move out there. And if you want to get something going against a lefty, might not be a bad idea. Try and get Beal started off at first base with a hair like Woods at the plate. Maybe you get McFadden to make a mistake. Again, McFadden is going to be the incoming freshman at UMass Amherst as first pitch. Woods pops it behind home plate. And Beal, collect, who had collected two hits on Friday, both singles, as you need to talk about the extra base hit power. This good on base guy, that's the reason he's batting second in this lineup. This guy who's going to make a lot of contact, not necessarily drive the ball. Woods fouls it back to the screen once again, 0-2. And, and Beal, who is on base on Friday's game against Paul Bailey, is Chris Gallant had an absolute cannon arm from left field. able to hose down Beal at home plate. 
terrific pitch and catch from the left fielder to the catcher. Unfortunately, Beal was cut down and again. As Beal extends his lead at first base, McFadden gives him a glare and now will toss over. So Beal is doing his job right there. He's drawing the attention away from Woods at the plate. With the count 0-2, McFadden, don't worry about the guy on base. Let's, let's take care of Woods, who's one of the more dangerous hitters in the NCBL. He's a fantastic power hitter, so I want to focus on him. As Woods gets caught looking on a fastball on the outer third of the plate. First punch out picked up by McFadden. It's a big one as well. Woods, who 15 of his hits have, and eight of them have gone for extra bases. As you mentioned, always a threat at home plate. And now bring up the cleanup man, Cameron Cyprian. So a little bit about McFadden as I think uh, Cyprian has to fetch a new bat here. McFadden sits in the upper 80s. He can touch about 90 miles an hour with a fastball. He's got a good arm side run on the fastball, so that means it's going to break away from right-hand hitters. It's going to tail in on lefties. So that makes him tough on those left-hand batters. Good slider. That's probably his best pitch. Also mixes in a changeup. So this is your ideal three-pitch tall lefty who's a guy who can dominate when he's on. And if he's got good command, which he's shown throughout this summer, uh, it's going to be really tough to string together hits against him and get guys on base. Oh. Again, Beal over at first base after his one-out single as Cyprian takes the called strike. Look at this Kettlebaum lineup. This absolutely flashes the gap-to-gap -gap power. Cyprian up there with five doubles on the season. I think the plate discipline's the thing that stands out up and down this lineup. It's what makes them so relentless. You look at why why is this team 10 and three? How are they dominating the league? It's that they don't give away at bats. Every single out is tough. And when it forces your starters out of the game earlier, it, it, you tap into that bullpen for the rest of these teams and it makes things happen. Beals off on the pitch, throw down from Rod Butler and they got him. Rob Butler flashing the arm there. That's how we end things here in the first inning. No runs, one hit, no errors, nobody left on base through half an inning. Stay with us here on the NCBO Broadcast Network. Bottom of the first inning here in Newport, Rhode Island as Fishers Island Lemonade Squad against their first licks against Ty Achille, the big southpaw out of Merrimack College. After Rob Butler gunned down Christian Beal to end things in that first inning. So this will be Healy's fifth appearance of the summer, third start, nine and a third innings of work. He is one and one overall. He's an ERA just under 10. He's allowed 11 runs, only 10 of those earned, over nine and a third. 10 strikeouts, 11 walks, has allowed one home run. Not a lot of hits, he's only given up eight hits, so under a hit per inning, but 
the control issues have been omnipresent for Healy so far this summer. He's gotten a lot of opportunities for this Kettlebottom squad and hasn't been able to work deep into starts. We've seen him be pretty efficient at times and then just seems to lose command of his arsenal, and that's when he gets into trouble. You got multiple guys on base. You make one mistake, ball in the gap, two, three runs are coming home. So he's going to face a pretty tough test against a Fisher's Island squad that's looked a lot better here in the last couple of weeks. They've made some additions, and you got to like how this lineup coming together for head coach Frank Holbrook. Yeah, again, Spencer, Smith, and Ass and Kopak were at it. Now this is their sixth game playing as first pitch misses out. And they'll be without Max Power today, who we understand was injured Friday night out of the lineup today. And that Spencer Smith, who has been a staple as a leadoff hitter here for Frank Holbrook's ball club was held hitless on Friday against South Coast Health, his first game without a hit. Or Pretty reaching base. All three of those pitches close to start this at bat for Healy. Right on that outer half, just missing the corner. That's good discipline here from Smith. And there's a called strike from our Oakland umpire, James Fonseca. Christopher Lima, the field umpire here for today. At least 3 1. That one's ripped hard up the ground, up the middle. And Spencer Smith collects the first hit for Fisher's Island here in the bottom of the first inning. Well, he saw four consecutive pitches on that outer half to start the at bat. He gets another one from Healy there. Doesn't try to do too much with it. You know, if you try to pull that ball and really get it out, you're going to roll right over to second base. So, not a bad job there by Smith, just trying to guide that back up the middle. And he's aboard with a leadoff hit front of the heart of this lineup, which has been rapidly improving. And Addison Kopak, who stands in, has been a big part of that resurgence for Fishers Island in the last couple of weeks. They got a chance to lock down the three seed if they could string together a couple of solid games here. Yeah, a team that struggled out of the gate is now three and two over the last five games, again, since Kopak and Smith were added to the roster. They're only, they're only a game back of Paul Bailey's, which is six and seven, Fishers Island at five and eight. So they might have a chance to get the two seed, but regardless, it doesn't really make a huge difference. You just want to make sure you're not the four, so you miss the playoffs. Again, how it works here are just four teams in the league. And three of the four make it. A couple tiebreakers in place as well, but the one seed will get the bye, which looks like it's going to be kettle bottom. And then you got two and three would play each other to play into the championship game then for a three-game series as the one once fouled back. So the way it's going to work, according to a press release by the league from Commissioner Mike Falcone, is that the playoffs will begin August 18th and 19th with a wild card game on Tuesday. That's on 8-17. You see that on the left of your screen. So Tuesday will be the wild card game, three versus two, to make the championship series, which will be the next day. As Kopak goes down looking, big first out for Ty Keeley. So championship series, which will feature this Kettlebottom squad, will begin with game one, Tuesday night, 6.30. They'll face the winner of that wild card matchup. And then game two on Wednesday, 3 o'clock. Then game three, if necessary, will be at 7 o'clock. So it should be a real exciting finish to this season. That's why they, this is the... Second to last Sunday, you have a full another three games next week and then right into the playoffs. So, Yeah, Kettlebottom head coach David Fisher, who's the head coach at the University of Rhode Island, and he talked about in, an, in a quote that it wouldn't be s summer college baseball without somebody taking home a title. These players have given it all throughout this summer and to be able to play for a championship is very meaningful, something that no one will forget, especially under the circumstances this summer. Especially, you know, other summer leagues, you, you get rings and stuff. That's always some nice hardware you can bring home. Well, I don't know about rings. Well, I don't know about rings. Maybe here, some ring pops. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what they have in the budget. But you give a lot of credit to Commissioner Falcone and, and his staff of volunteers and assistants. They've really done an outstanding job just to be able to put this thing together in a matter of weeks and get yeah. these players back on the field. Two balls and two strikes on Jake Core, the second baseman. And that's what really kind of said the first week, you know, we, a couple games, is it f testing it out for the first two or three games or so, and then we're underway, and that's kind of what happened here this summer. As runner going, Coro goes down swinging. Cyprian pump fakes and 
Able to slide into second base is Spencer Smith with a stolen bag. Oh, back to back strikeouts for Healy. Good base running there by Smith to get into scoring position with two outs. A little bit of a delayed reaction there by Cyprian. Not able to get that throw down there in time. So, chance here for Billy Butler with a runner in scoring position. I think it was just on a swing and miss from Cora. Might have just for, you know, half a second or so delayed Cyprian from throwing down. And Smith has some speed as well. Yeah. I being a catcher is the toughest position in college baseball. That's my opinion. It's the toughest position to develop from a, a pro prospect standpoint. It's just hard to get those reps. You have to not only be proficient at handling a pitching staff and working with a number of guys, that, especially in summer ball that you're not used to working with as Butler swings and misses. And, and then you, you have to work on your offensive game. So you have to be... It's not <laughs> easy. You can't, can't struggle at the plate either. So it's the toughest, toughest position, I think, for college coaches and then for professional organizations to find and, and cultivate. Oh, one misses inside to Billy Butler. Ball on a strike. And we've been fortunate to see a couple good ones, though. Cyprian's been good. Alex Lane, one of the mm -hmm. league leaders in RBI. Good catcher. Alex Martinez for Paul Bailey's, a young catcher who's got a lot of power. Called strike again on Butler. He's down on the count one and two. Yeah, remember we had a guy last summer up on the Cape named David Avidi of Grand Canyon. And people and scouts are raving about his defensive abilities, unfortunately. The bat was never there. He was barely hitting above the Mendoza line at Grand Canyon. But he's MLB defensive ready. I think teams now, professional teams, are willing to overlook the offensive side of things because they've become more proficient in analyzing things like pitch framing, which mm -hmm. reveal the, the value of uh, yeah, how many defensive How many catcher. strikes you can buy from an right. umpire. Yeah, pitches that are outside of the zone, they're able to frame and get the called strike. And I think teams are now have a greater understanding of the value of those catchers as, as they used to. Butler goes around, strike three, uh, corner James Fonseca, and Healy strikes out the side or through one, still scoreless between Kennebottom and Fisher's Allen. Stay with us here on the NCBL Broadcast Network. Top of the second inning, it will be the four, five, and six hitters as Kevin Cyprian returns to the dish. She did bat in that first thing, but on official AB as Christian Beal was caught stealing by catcher Rob Butler. So he gets to have a second look, but the first time around <laughs> against Will McFadden. As Cyprian drives out in the left field, Linsky backing up, turns around, and one hops off the wall. And Cyprian is going to cruise into second base with the leadoff double here to start the second. So for Cyprian, I think clearly sitting on that pitch after seeing a couple from McFadden before he was stranded at the plate end last inning. So he just got that off the end of the bat. If he gets that off the barrel, it's out of here. But instead, it's a one hopper off the wall. Litsky, I don't think, got a good read of it off the bat. And Cyprian able to jog into second with leadoff double. 
for Cyprian. That is his sixth double of the season, which puts him second on the team behind Eric Ramirez. And again, they're about, you look at the league leaders in doubles, you got Holeswasser up there. I mean, where is it? Scott Holeswasser from Paul Billy's up with the standings as Lane bounces that one off McFadden's ankle, trickles over to Groskopf, the first baseman, which they make the out. So technically that's going to go as a 1-3 put out. And it looked like it hit McFadden right on that right ankle, which is his plant leg, and that's concerning. He's waving everybody off, as we see on the replay. Yep, right off the oh, on the inside of the ankle, too. That's That can't feel good. Yeah. Oh, it's like getting stung by a bee. Yeah, it's, talk about getting, you know, fouling one off your ankle area, and this time a comeback or right off your ankle. Yeah, but for, fortunately, it wasn't a line drive. Yeah. It hit the ground first, so at least that slowed it down a little bit, but that cannot feel good for a pitcher. McFadden showing his best. Hockey goalie skills out there with the kick save. And saves a run as well. And a beaut. <laughs> as Will Panarello, who's been hot at the dish. 1 0 is cut on a miss. Ball and a strike. Which Alex Lane, who leads the league in RBIs, unfortunately doesn't get one there. 1 1 to Panarello. Inside, 2 and 1. But Lane, I mean, he struck out 17 times in 13 games coming into today. So if that's a guy you circle on the lineup card and say, All right, I need to, I got to run in scoring, scoring position, nobody out. I need a strikeout here. So McFadden, that's a tough break. And now, just get that run home. Panarello loops one out to right center. Meachin center makes the catch, throw home towards Rob Butler, not in time. And Kettlebottom strikes first here in the top of the second. Another good piece of hitting where if you're Panarello, you don't try to do too much. Get get the run home, get a fly ball deep enough into that right center gap. No chance for Meech to get a throw home in time. So that's that's what makes Kettlebottom so difficult. They're relentless. Just when you think, you know, McFadden threw seven pitches in the first inning and all of a sudden you're down one nothing. Just like that. As Eric Ramirez takes a called strike and they're second in the league at average. But as you mentioned, they do a lot of the small things that add up throughout a game. So we do have a couple of uniform changes. If you're looking at the rosters and the statistics online, you're going to see a couple different numbers than you used to. Kevin Cyprian wearing number 13, Alex Lane wearing number 2. Will Panarello also with a different number. Uh, Nate Vigent's wearing number 18, so we'll keep you updated on those changes as they come in. 2-1 for McFadden. Anthony is called a strike. And yeah, they got two sets of uniforms now every team. And they got the neon, and then Eric Ramirez is wearing just the regular orange. It doesn't matter what he wears, he can hit. As long as he can play. He's got a uniform. It's all you need for baseball. Hey, eight doubles. You're putting the ball in the gaps like that? Yeah. Take it. The UMass Dartmouth Corsair. Ramirez, who's tied with Scott Holswas for the league for doubles. Cyprian's now up there after his double in this inning. So you got three guys tied for the first place lead. And so leaves that one outside, full of three and two. Ramirez, 11 hits on the summer, eight of those for extra bases. No homers, but it's not really his game. Really good defensive shortstop, too. Payoff pitch. Ramirez skies that one down the first base side. Grosk off the first base and wandering over. But that one just gets out of play. So we'll do it again. With Nick Lima no, not in the broadcast booth this afternoon, I feel obligated to ask, have you gone, gone through the, the history of Cardine's field on your broadcast, Thomas? I've done a, a couple <laughs> times. As Ramirez jolts that one to left field. Litsky turning around. And that ball's out of here. Eric Ramirez, first home run of the summer, gets out over left field, and it's now 2-0 Kettle Bottom. Really good swing by Ramirez as he barreled up that pitch. Got it right into that gap in the fence. You see there's a cutout where the tree has grown through. Great looking swing that time. Right off the barrel. Right in the cutout there where the tree grows through. That one, I think it would have cleared the fence regardless of where he hit it, but a little easier to get it out in that range. So great piece of hitting there by Ramirez. 
As Nate Vision takes ball one, and you say he didn't have a home run of the season, the huh? same same thing again. It goes right after it. And yeah, they, they don't give away at bats. Ramirez doesn't homer. Been on point this afternoon. <laughs> good thing it's nine innings. Well, I, I never said I was a good forecaster. I'm a good recapper. <laughs> You'd be a weatherman, you know? Yeah, more of an analyst, not a, not a, <laughs> not a meteorologist. One ball, one strike to count on Nate Vigeon, the second baseman out of Rhode Island College. Is Kettlebaum struck for two in this inning. Vigeon fouls it off the catcher. No, two strikes on the second baseman. Question now is for Kettlebottom is how long can Healy go? He threw 19 pitches in the first inning. Typically, guys are limited to about 60, 70 pitches max. So, you know, can he even get through four, five innings? And then you're turning it over to the bullpen. And they have a good bullpen, but it that's always risky. It depends who's available. We saw Zach Lises go a couple innings. Use Cleases for five, so you got to think he's not available. Gamble went two innings, but in the extra inning game on Friday night. So it kind of depends. But he's a lot of arms on Thursday, so it had some arms as well. 2-2. Two, two. Misses downstairs. Well, if there's one name that you circle and you want to watch for, it's Mike Webb, new addition for Kettlebottom. Yeah. He's a guy who throws hard, power pitcher, misses a lot of bats, struck out the side and is first appearance of the NCBL, so he's a guy that you can turn to in a big situation if you need a strikeout. Fitchin just slaps one foul over towards Dave Fisher. He didn't want to make a play down there. Third base side, he's fixing something along the fence. And Might be lining up some substitutions as he is known to do. Yeah. But a good, good defensive swing there by Vision just to stay alive, prolong the at-bat, make McFadden work. McFadden's payoff once again. Vigin hits one out towards right field. Ranging over to his right is Anthony Ramos in the gap. And he makes the catch for the third out of the inning. But Kettlebottom strikes for two hits. Two runs on two hits. No errors. Nobody left on base. And LA 2 0 through an inning and a half. We're listening to Newport Collegiate Baseball League presented by People's Credit Union. David Meach takes ball one here in the bottom of the second inning. Kettlebottom struck for two in the top half of this sitting a sacrifice fly and then a solo home run from Eric Ramirez. Yeah, as Ty Kelly gets Meach to go around. Haley who struck out the side in the first after allowing a leadoff single to Spencer Smith. More importantly, he didn't walk a batter. Yeah. Only went the ball three once. That was on Spencer Smith, the leadoff man. Slapped a single back up the middle. Yeah, he's been really working ahead of the counts here. Two and two now on Meach. It's Meach, McGill, and Jared Groska up the three. Fisher's Allen hitters do up. Haley's 2-2. Two, two. Oh, 
Wave it a miss, strike three, make it four in a row. Healy is punched down here via the strikeout. Meach way out in front on that one. Good start for Healy, and I think the target here is a couple innings. Maybe you can get him to four, maybe five. But the pitch count always is the issue with Healy. Especially just a young arm here. For this is the perfect setting for a guy like him to develop and learn and f work through different situations and further his development. Nice, McGill sends one out in the air to center field. Beal backtracking up, and that one's off the top of the wall. McGill will hold up at second base, and that's a one-out double for the extra hitter from Bryant. Well, you can tell by the reaction from Beal in center. The only question was whether or not it was going to get out. It was clearly deep enough. It just hit about 25 feet up on that 28-foot high fence out in right center field. It's one of the deeper parts of the ballpark. It's, it's one of those parts, you know, when you look up at it, it's like, ah, oh, that doesn't have a chance, and you just got to wait and see. You know, you can't really predict much out there, especially where the field juts out a little bit. Yeah, all you can really do is watch the fielders, and sometimes they'll try and deke you. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> and, and, the, and the batter, too. But uh, that's a smart outfielder, then, especially if oh yeah. guys on second trying to tag up. Yeah, it's mostly with guys on base, but it's a challenging ballpark to play if you've never been an outfielder here before, but a lot of these guys are local. They probably played here either in high school or a, you know, Sunset League. They probably have experience here before playing in a summer collegiate league if they're upperclassmen. As that's a high chopper out to Gustin at third, sets his feet. And he'll retire Grosskuth for the second out. Nice job there by Gustin, watching the runner, look the runner back into the bag. And plant your feet, make a strong throw. He's really good. Dolbashian's good at the high corner. That's the thing, David Fisher, the head coach for Kettlebottom, he has a lot of options to work with. Yeah, can really move guys around, guys playing multiple positions. And Ramirez on the bench today as the extra hitter. You know, he's a guy who can play any position on the diamond. First pitch strike to Blaine Lidsky, the left fielder from Stonehill. So, you know, in a game in which you figure it's going to be pretty low scoring, these are the when you have to take advantage of opportunities. You have a runner in scoring position. You've got to come through here if you're Fisher's Island with the bottom of the order. You've got to try and get one back here, keep it close. You know, let's get guys had that big six RBI game against this Kettle Bottom team last Sunday. Two for four with a double. Also a hit by pitch, so reach base three times in that ball game. And he's seen a lot of Healy this summer, so the, this whole Fishers Island lineup has the last couple of weekends. So, got to make him pay here in these situations. Healy's two one. Letsky reaches forward and pops it up in the air, first base side. As that one touches down foul. It looked like Panarello had a shot to get it, but it just kept drifting out of his reach. That wind, which is blowing about 5 to 10 miles an hour, feels like it's gusting a little bit more than that at times. That's going to be a factor helping the fly, the fly balls carry out. Looks like it's sort of blowing out towards left at the moment. Well, especially anything that gets above the trees or yeah. above the grandstands here is going to carry a little bit more. Good pitch by Healy, just missed upstairs. So Linsky moves to count the full here at three balls and two strikes, two down the inning. McGill over at second base. That's 3-2, Linsky can't connect. Down on strikes he goes, two more punch outs in the inning. No runs on one hit, no errors, and McGill's left over at second base. We're through two innings here, kettle bottom. Two nothing lead over Fisher's Island.
Kettle Bottom looks to add to their 2-0 lead here in the top of the third inning. Big two-run inning in the second. It will Penarello sacrifice fly, and then Eric Ramirez with the big fly over the fence in left field as given Dave Fisher and his squad. This early lead as Braden Dolbeige in the shortstop will start things off. Dolbeige, who just finished his freshman year at Merrimack, or was in the middle of it before the season got canceled. So he, Ty Keeley, who is starting pitcher for Kettle Bonham, and him will be teammates next year. Dolbeige, 7 for 28 this summer. At the point. As Slatter from McFadden catches his zone. It's nothing in two. Yeah, that's the pitch that's the key for him. If he can throw that for strikes, basically a backdoor slider, a little frisbee that goes up there. And if he can spot that for strikes, it opens up everything else for him. As Delbajan's slow grounder to Addison Kopak at third. His oh. throw goes high over the first baseman, Groskoff, and flips to Butler at first base. And just getting back in time is Delbajan will be an E5. That throw was in another zip code. It was not close. Absolute airmail here as Kopak fielded. He had plenty of time. He just completely misfired. The Dolbejan rounding the bag. He had to scramble to get back. Just able to get in ahead of the tag as Butler came over and covered first. That's one of the other catchers, many things they do. Backing up first base as Gilmar tries to bone up the first base side, but that one trickles foul. So the sacrifice bunt, it's fallen out of vogue in professional baseball, but it can be useful. Yeah, it should have been here Friday that we saw a couple guys <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying to move over with the sacrifice bunt. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating development that not only do you have it in this league, but you have it in the Major League Baseball for this year. You have the, the runner on second mm -hmm. to start extra innings. So you have seen some teams do it, but not as many as you would think. It's just tough to give away any outs. It's a lost art in baseball. As McFadden snap throw. I was close. Typically, the situations where you have seen it done is if the leadoff runner reaches, so you have first and second in extra innings with nobody out. Then it makes sense because then you're playing for two runs, mm -hmm. not just one. We've okay. seen some teams then intentionally walk the guy to load the bases. We've seen that a couple times. Yeah, you want the force at any base in that situation. So that, that makes sense. Yeah, there's You're almost conceding at least one run. You want to prevent any further damage. So that's fun to watch the chess meet, <laughs> the chess match. And <laughs> sure enough, you intentionally walk a guy to load the bases, the next guy hits a home run. So that's yeah. that's how it goes sometimes. You can't, you can't predict what's going to happen. These, it's not robots. It's, These are humans. There's a plethora of decisions you can make in that situation, and I think that's what yeah. Tim Joyce and I were talking about that on Friday. I mean, you know, talking about the chess match. I mean, there, there literally is. You can do so many things. You, can, you know, whether the guy wants to pinch hit somebody or, but, or yeah. bring in a new guy, obviously, maybe to start the inning. I mean, here you can bring in a pitcher whenever, but... Yeah, it's funny. You talk about these are some of the most prepared coaches I've ever encountered, and all of them are head coaches at major programs, you know, Cap and Fisher, Hirschbane Botner, Holbrook. These guys, are they're competitive. They understand every situation in and out. And uh, there was a, one a couple of weeks ago as Gilmar strikes out swinging. It's a big first out for McFadden. But when Paul Bailey's blew that eight-run lead against Kettlebottom here at Cardinals Field, he, George Kaplan was talking after the game. He said, no, I was prepared. We were prepared. We just didn't execute. And he had everything scripted the way he wanted to as that run, that lead began to evaporate. And he said, yeah, I made all the decisions I wanted to. As we have McFadden thrown over to first, back safely he is still patient. He yeah. just said, you know, we just didn't execute. And <laughs> you can plan yeah. as much as you want. It's just not going to make the reality you want come to fruition. Especially if you got one guy that gets into trouble, you got your next man up, and that's what they kind of went through is the list of pitchers. Unfortunately. The, the definition of a nightmare in it. Yeah, that was. It's Jake Gustin takes ball one. Lead off hitter here for Kettlebottom, so second time through the order now against McFadden. Yeah, it's going to get much tougher for McFadden now. As Gustin flies one out to right, Ramos. Easy fly ball for him out there as Gustin didn't catch all of that when it got under it a bit. What an 
excellent afternoon here. The conditions are, are perfect. It's not too hot. You have sun, a little bit of a breeze to cool you off. This is ideal. This is, it's it's been humid the last yeah, couple of Sundays has. here at Cardians Field. So <laughs> it's pleasant, yeah. Even with the sea breeze, you know, you had temperatures at first pitch in the 90s most afternoons. So this is a welcome change here as we approach the middle of August. As Christian Beal calls time. Just don't jinx it here. We don't want to jinx things here if the wind stops just blowing here in Newport. Oh, we've had all kinds of weather conditions <laughs> over the years. You've had fog delays. You name it, we've seen it. Any hail delays? Oh, that's a good one. No, but I we have. Had, I haven't had one of those, so I'm just, I'm just curious. There was one situation. I think it was, it was almost a decade ago now, but clear skies, 635 start. 6.30, the skies just open up, oh. downpours. Field gets soaked, can't play. <laughs> As Beal flies it out to left center field, Meach calling off Litsky for the third out. Here he ran the inning, so back-to-back -back flyouts to end the top of the third inning. They strand a man on first base, throw two and a half. Kettlebaum still holding a 2-0 lead over Fishers Island. Rob Butler, Anthony Ramos, and Spencer Smith. 9-10-1 here for Fishers Island. Look to put their first run across here as Ty Kelly first pitch at the belt for a called strike. And Kelly so far, five strikeouts through two innings. Not too shabby. Yeah, he's at 35 pitches. He's been pretty efficient even with all the strikeouts. So Healy has his best stuff this afternoon. That's a great sign for Kettlebottom. Definitely need to mention, you know, we're talking about how far is he going to go and he's, you know, if he keeps looking sharp like that, why not, you know? The issue has been second time through the order. Once guys have a chance to see him and he starts to have to pitch out of the strike zone a little bit more, guys are laying off, they're not being as aggressive. He gets into some of those deep counts. And that's when he can get into trouble. See so right here, you get that first pitch strike, you think, all right, I'm in the driver's seat in this at bat. All of a sudden, it's three and one. So Rob Butler, who, brother of Billy Butler, ball four, and Rob works the leadoff walk, starting out the third. So Healy's been in this situation a couple of times this summer where the command's kind of gone on him in starts, and he has to figure out a way in these situations to get out of jams consistently. That's the, that's the mark of a good starting pitcher. Is you can put traffic on the base pass, but can you get out of it? And some of the best pitchers in the NCBL this summer, Mike Sanson, Riley Tevens, uh, those, those types of starting pitchers, they've been able to consistently get out of those jams without overpowering stuff. It's a matter of trusting your fielders, throwing strikes. He's got to be able to do that consistently, but he's only a freshman. It's still a lot yep. of time in his development to get there. That's why a guy like Ryan Brown who doesn't throw that hard, just trusts yep. his stuff. And Blake Takar is another prime example. He's told me multiple times that sometimes he, he likes having guys on base and gets in the trouble because he pitches better. He said he pitches better to the jams. That's why we've seen him, you know, he gives up, you know, maybe two or three runs in his first two innings, and then he'll go seven innings, and you know, five, five more innings after that, and not allow 
maybe only one base runner. So when he's in this, one of those pitchers that's in the zone, he's really in the zone. Yeah, it depends on your mindset. Do you, do you do you view it as a as a challenge or is it you're terrified of the situation? Mm -hmm. So I think for a lot of young pitchers, it's about overcoming that mindset of all right, now I'm in trouble. It's instead being like, all right, I got this. All I need is a ground ball up the middle. Just as much of a mental sport as many other sports, you know. Absolutely. Three balls and one strike on the right fielder, Anthony Ramos. Reach base in six straight games. As challenge fastball there, Ramos going for the fences, <laughs> trying to put that ball. He wanted, he, wanted to tie, he wanted to tie this game up. Yeah, he wanted to put that in another part of Aquidneck Island. Payoff pitch. Foul tip into the mint of Cyprian. Another strike out here for Healy. Get the K's going. He's got six. He's faced ten batters. Six have been set down by way of the K. That's a pretty good start. But now, second time through the order, it's going to get exponentially more difficult from here forward. As you mentioned, second time through the order, Spencer Smith, the leadoff hitter. Shortstop out of Northeastern with Rob Buller off of first. Slider doesn't bend in. And if there are any Mets fans out there, the, the, the stance is very reminiscent of Jeff McNeil, their all-star infielder, outfielder. It's very upright. That right foot out to the side. As Smith lines went towards right field, charging in as Woods throws to second. Oh. So that's going to be a fielder's choice. And just one of those balls. Woods was charging and able to pick it cleanly off the turf. But yeah, that's just tough for <laughs> tough if you're uh, Spencer Smith. It's tough as a base runner. If you're Rob Butler, you, you don't want to you don't want to get a double. You don't want to get stuck where it's a double play. Where if if Woods comes in and makes that catch and you're halfway to second, yeah, you don't there's get two outs. Yeah, so anything then. So he didn't have much of a choice no. on that, and unfortunately, just got caught there. So now Addison Cope packed the third baseman out of URI with two down in the inning. And Spencer Smith now over at first base. Healy comes set from the belt, the one out. As Kopak drives that one to left field. Gilmar racing back. And this one's well out of here, out to one of the houses in the left center. It's a two-run bomb for Addison Kopak. And we're all tied up at two apiece. According to the TrackMan data system here at Cardians Field, 436 feet on that home run. Absolute rocket off the bat of Addison Kopak. Beautiful swing. Absolutely barreled that one. And Kopak, who again has that, it. That might, right here, this might be the longest home run of the season, folks. Ball was absolutely tattooed. Wow. And the only could do is just watch that one go. As first pitch swings, Jay Coro, third base side, as that one squeaks out. You know, getting a Kopak, just his sixth game. This is his fourth start, now with two home runs. You know, we just would have loved to see him play a full summer here and just see how many home runs. As that's a slow chopper out the middle as Coro now aboard here with a single. So the tail of the tape officially on that Kopak home run, 436 feet, exit velocity of 100 miles an hour. So to put that in context, major league average exit velocity on a batted ball is 91 miles an hour. Yeah. That ball was scorched, and anytime you get an exit velocity that hard, if you get any sort of a you know, launch angle on it, mm -hmm. it's going to leave the ballpark. So that might be the most impressive home run we've seen this yeah. summer. The hardest hit ball exit velocity wise so far this summer has been 106 from Lee McGill. That puts you in Aaron Judge, Joey yeah. Gallo, <laughs> Giancarlo Stanton territory there. Now, how do you feel, Lee McGill? <laughs> the key is to be able to do it consistently, though. You got some guys who are power hitters. Yeah, they can get one like that, but to be able to, to do that over an extended period of time, that's where you got. Like Gene Carlos really always up there in the exit velocity ranks. He also strikes out quite a bit. 
Don't tell it to a Yankees fan. I'm not a Yankees fan, but I'm just saying. There's nothing wrong with striking out now. I think well, three yeah. true outcomes is the way the game's going, but that's what makes Scott Holzwasser so interesting. He's kind of a different style of baseball than the way professional baseball is going. League leader in hits this summer in the NCBL. 2-1 a Butler comes inside, hits him on the elbow guard as he'll toss the barrel. So all of a sudden this inning is spiraling out of control on Healy. It looked like he was going to get out of it after getting the fielder's choice, and then Kopak hits the two-run dinger. Coro falls with a single, and he's maybe the fastest guy in the NCBL, and now you get two on. David Meach has got some pop. And yeah, Meach with one home run here on the summer. Also four doubles as well. As Coral is going off towards third base, Cyprian's throw into left field. And he's going to score coming in standing up. I was going to mention it at Coro. It might not be a bad idea to try to send him here. See if you can force a throw. Cyprian's throw off the mark into left field. Another run crosses the plate. That'll be a throwing error. I think he would get credit for a stolen base, and then yep. it's a throwing error. So it'll be a steal for Coro, his 11th of the summer. It'll be a stolen base, E2, on Cyprian. And now we have a mound visit. Now with Dave Fisher to Ty Keeley and Kevin Cyprian. Well, the pitch count's probably not an issue here. The issue's going to be, all right, can we get this last out? Let's, let's go, guys. Come on. It's only a you know, one-run deficit at the moment, so with this lineup, you're in this game, so the question now is can you get out of it without any further damage? one to Meach misses high. It's 2 and nothing. And you still go back to that fly ball by Kopak. It's just different sound off the bat when you get one hit that hard. Especially with a with a wood barrel compared to metal. Meach just pitched a 2 0 pitch to Meach. Just grounds out foul. I do like those aluminum bats. Yeah? Yeah. When you, you watch some of the big guys take batting practice with them. You're like, okay. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're hitting home runs with ease. <laughs> Ball would, flies. Yeah, wood bat, if you don't catch the sweet spot, it's not going to catch as much as a metal bat's more forgiving as. 2-1 ground and over to Vision. That second base goes down to a knee and retires Meech for the third out of this inning. But Fisher's Allen takes a 3-2 lead over Kettlebottom and thanks to the two-run bomb off the barrel of Addison Kopak. Listen to NCBL Baseball presented by People's Credit Union. Fisher's Allen takes a 3-2 lead over Kettlebottom here in the top of the fourth inning. And we're going to hand the play-by-play -play duties over to George Bissell. Thank you very much, Thomas Zanzarella. Middle innings, it's the heart of the order coming up for Kettlebottom. 3-4-5, Matt Woods, Kevin Cyprian, Alex Lane do up as Will McFadden. So on 40 pitches through three innings, delivers ball one to Woods. Woods is 0-for-1. He struck out looking to end the first inning. Tall southpaw deals, 1-0. He's on the outside corner, called strike. Woods hitting 366, 15 for 41 this summer, the 509 on base percentage, slugging 
a cool 6.59. As he swings and hits a towering pop up to the left side over in foul ground, the third baseman Kopak will watch it land out of play. One and two to Woods. He's homered twice. He's walked 10 times. Stolen seven bases, six doubles. Yeah, Woods is just an all-around guy. We talk about multiple tools. This guy can, he's got a key knife at the dish as well. I mean, really exciting to watch. Yeah, good plate discipline, quality fielder out and right. He takes a ball inside. McFadden missing up and in with the slider. Even the count at two and two. I'm sure Ryan Klosterman, Matt Bryant's got to be excited about this kid. McFadden is ready. 2-2 delivery. Misses outside with a fastball. The count runs full. McFadden, pair of strikeouts. Only damage against him coming on the two run, or I should say the home run by Eric Ramirez. Well, Panarello delivered a sacrifice. Flies, this ball is hit high to right center field. Center fielder Meech leaping at the wall. He reaches up and makes the catch. Round number one. Yeah, he, smiling out there is he didn't think it was going to go that far. Nonetheless, second might have jumped up a bit on him. and That's that a, wind coming yeah, into play again. Had to jump up to make the catch, and we just got a little, little bit jammed on that one to look like. Is yeah, he, yeah, he got it off the end of the bat. Didn't get all of it. Well, if he got all of it, that, that would have been over the fence then. We would have had a tie ball game once again. Here's Kevin Cipriani. He doubled and scored a run his last time up. He's seen McFadden twice in this one because he was stranded at the plate when Christian Beal was thrown out to end the first inning. The 0 one This is outside, 1-1. One one. McFadden. Going up two runs on three hits so far. Two of those three hits for extra bases. Both of those in the second inning. Managed to work around a error to start last inning. As Cyprian fouls one to the screen behind home plate. One and two yep. on Kevin. Uh, Jarvis Christian batting 256 with a 408 on base percentage. Nine walks, only seven strikeouts. Cyprian, he's doubled six times this summer. The one two. Swung on and lifted the right. Going back is Ramos, ranging to his left. He's under it, makes the catch for out number two. I was about to mention, you know, since, you know, he had a guy reach last inning, which would have been a regular put out. So it's really a nice bounce back here for McFadden after the two runs second inning, especially, you know, young kid allowing a home run to Ramirez. And you know, ever since then, it's really been smooth sailing besides, you know, the one error and a guy reaching. A lot of hard hit balls. A lot of flyouts. And which means these hitters having a tough time squaring him up in the last couple of innings. Two up, two down here in the fourth as Alex Lane stands in and takes ball one. Lane's 0 for 1. He had a line drive back up the middle that deflected off of McFadden. Over to first baseman Jared Groskoth, who recorded the putout and was back in the second inning. Takes ball two. Lane, three homers. He's walked six times, but he struck out 17 times. 44 at bats entering this afternoon. He swings and misses. Big cut at a heater that time. So Lane's slugging close to 500, 360 on base percentage, but all those strikeouts. Well, he's definitely flashed the power this year. 1-2, swung on a miss, laid on a fastball, and the count is even up at 2-2. Two two. He had a two-home run game earlier in the season. So let's see where McFadden elects to go. 2-2 two -two pitch to Alex Lane. Just outside, went for the slider, looking for that outside corner, missed it. Yeah, here with McFadden, I mean, you don't want to leave anything in the zone when two out walk wouldn't really hurt you, but. Payoff pitch, swung on and missed. A one, two, three inning for Will McFadden. And we're through three and a half here at Cardinals Field, three to two. Fishers Island over Kettlebottom on the NCBL Broadcast Network.
Welcome back to Cardines Field. George Bissell alongside Thomas Zinzarella on the NCBL Broadcast Network. 3-2 Fishers Island over Kettle Bottom. It's Tag Healy back out for another inning of work. Face the bottom of the order. McGill, Grosgoth, and Litsky do up in the bottom of the fourth. McGill, he doubled his last time up in the second. Was stranded in scoring position. Takes pitch outside, ball one. McGill hitting 270 with a 413 on base percentage, 10 for 37. Seven walks as well this summer. McGill out of Bryant serving as the extra hitter in this afternoon contest. Takes a called strike and it's one and one. Good contest so far. Both pitchers have been on point. We've seen a couple of long balls. Eric Ramirez launching a solo shot. Addison Kopak with a two run blast. A mammoth tater to left center field. So Liam McGill takes ball two. Yeah, we've seen really both pitchers, you know, bounce back as well nicely. And we'll see here after Healy after like three runs in the last inning how he can recover from that inning. Last Sunday, got through three innings, didn't get through the fourth. So we'll see how he fares here this afternoon. Towering pop up on the infield. Lobeja in the shortstop. A couple of steps to his left is under it, makes the catch for out number one. Well, we've talked. Major league yeah, pop-up that time. That was. That hung up there for a bit, and you got to credit Dobajan at shortstop, you know, especially in the sun. And here at Cardines, we talk about how different times of the day, it can be really tough. You can see him in the replay trying to shadow the sun away. Hey, I don't think he had any sunglasses on. That was impressive. Pitches upstairs. All one. The no shades look at short. Yeah. That's a, that's I a saw, bold move. It's all vision, I think, on Friday or Thursday. Not without shades and track a ball and, uh, on the outfield grass. How do, how do you do it? <laughs> He's an anchor man. That's how I'll <laughs> fly ball to the left. Kilmart is there. He makes the catch for out number two. Jared Gross got retired on just two pitches. And Ty Keeley, two up, two down here to start the fourth. Well, that's the way you want to do it. It's, it helps too when guys swing early in the count and you're able to record outs and gives you a little more confidence in on the mound too. You know, say, hey, we've got two pitches in and out. Yeah, it's, it's one thing when, when the coaching staff is talking to you and saying, hey, you, you got to be more efficient. you got to be able to work through these types of situations. It's one thing to tell a guy that. And it's another thing for him to go out there and actually do it and say, oh, I can do this. And that's, I think, what we're experiencing here with Healy. He's, every week he gets a little bit better. You see a little bit more improvement. He's been a lot more in the zone here this afternoon as Blaine Litsky makes a call at strike. Here's the 0-1 from Healy. Breaking ball on the outer half. Called strike. He's quickly ahead. 0-2. Yeah, one of his best breaking balls I think we've seen today. Perfectly low, perfectly located on the outside corner. Started off the plate. Only one walk for Ty Healy. He has also hit a batter. Deals low in the dirt. Good stop by Cyprian. It's one and two. Healy. Six strikeouts. He has not recorded a strikeout since the third inning, however. He had five in the first two innings. Litsky swings and lifts one to right. Woods is in the gap. He makes the catch for the out that retires the side. One, two, three inning for Ty Healy. We're through four at Cardines Field. Three to two, Fishers Island over Kettlebottom on the NCBL Broadcast Network.
fifth inning at Cardines Field. George Bissell alongside Thomas Zinzarella on the NCBL Broadcast Network. 3-2, to two, Fishers Island over Kettle Bottom, and it's Will McFadden back out for another inning of work. The tall left-hander out of UMass Amherst has allowed two runs on three hits, a pair of strikeouts. All the damage coming back in that second inning. It was Kevin Cipriano had a leadoff double. Came around to score on a sacrifice fly by Will Panarello and then Eric Ramirez. The ensuing batter followed with a solo homer to right center field. It's the only damage against McFadden so far. And if he can get through the fifth without any damage, he'd be in line for the win. Should the score remain unchanged. Swinging a high pop up into shallow left center field off the bat of Will Panarello. The shortstop Smith is there. Makes the catch route number one. So both these pitchers cruising through the middle innings. They've been very efficient. Healy coming off a 10 pitch inning to end the fourth. And now one pitch, one out for McFadden here to start the fifth. And both of them starting the next inning with the pop up to the shortstop. One in the fourth, obviously one in the fifth, but interesting. A man who did not hit a pop up his last time up, Eric Ramirez. Solo shot his first of the summer back in the second inning. Corsair out of UMass Dartmouth. Swings and lines one to third. Kopak is there. He stabs it for the innings. Second out. Two pitches, two outs. That one hit a lot. Yeah, Addison. Much Co harder. Kopak didn't have to move really a step. He just kind of reacted and just put the glove about above his head. But it's that type of batted ball. You can see how Ramirez has... You know, eight mm -hmm. doubles on the summer. That's a line drive. That might be a triple down there. It's tough with the shared bullpens. Usually that ball gets ruled uh, a ground rule double if it rolls into some of the equipment there. As Nate Vigin takes ball one, but he's got a good look at swing, Ramirez does. No, he definitely does, and one of the hottest sitters in this lineup right now for Kettle Bottom. Vision takes ball two, patient hitter. He's walked seven times, five for 23 on the summer. He's only struck out five times. So he's a grinder who stays alive at the plate. It works the count really, and adds more pitches to the pitch count. You know, not every batter in your lineup is going to be a superstar as Vision takes ball three, but you want the guys who are towards the end of the lineup to be guys who, who, who are fighters who are going to make opposing pitchers work, and that's exactly what Vision's done. In his 10 games so far this summer, he takes a call strike for McFadden. He's trying to work his second consecutive 1-2-3 inning. And Vigen worked a full count his first round. You mentioned even he only flew out, but still he'll work it to 3-2, foul off a couple pitches, and work it to 7-8-9 pitches and an A-B. Pitch is swung on, and one hopper to short. Smith is up with it. Throws to first in plenty of time. Nine straight set down by Will McFadden. We're through five here at Cardinesville. Three to two, Fishers Island over Kettlebottom on the NCBL Broadcast Network. Bottom of the fifth inning at Cardines Field. George Bissell and Thomas Zinzarella on the NCBL broadcast. Network number nine man Rob Butler is at to lead things off. It'll be followed by Anthony Ramos, the number 10 man, and then Spencer Smith back to top of the order. Ground ball chopped back up the middle. Dolbejian, the shortstop, up with it and throws to first in plenty of time to get 
Butler, who's 0 for 1, walked back in the third. 6-3 on the put out, and once again, we're moving quickly as you see a fine defensive play here by Delbasian. Yeah, Delbasian having to charge it, and sometimes too, when you're charging like that, throw across your bonnet, the ball gets stuck in the webbing, and you can't get it out cleanly, and it forces a bad throw, but Delbasian, no trouble that time. It'll throw a strike over to Panarello at first. That's the type of batted ball that you dream of as a shortstop. It's a chance to put a little flash into it. Swinging a high fly ball to left. Ramos flying out to Gilmart on one pitch. So I don't know what's going on. Like uh, lately we've seen a lot of first and second pitch swinging. They're liking the pitches they see, so why not take a hack at it? Yeah, it's one thing to be aggressive and then can be too aggressive in an at bat as you see Ramos flying out to left. I think we saw some of those fly balls carrying earlier on in the game, not getting as much mm -hmm. lift this time. As Spencer Smith takes a call, it's strike. Ty Healy trying to complete five. And Healy's longest outing of the summer prior to that was just three innings. He had nine and a third innings total in four appearances coming in today. Delivers a call, it's strike to Spencer Smith, so now he's a strike away from a one, two, three, fifth inning. See if Smith can stay alive. A shortstop out of Northeastern. Hitting 333, five games, a double, a triple. Seven for 21 in NCBL play. It's one for two on the afternoon. Single and stole a base in the first. Grounded into fielder's choices last time up. Fouls one off to the left side. Ricochets off the protective netting. Back onto the field to play. Yeah, ball kind of gets tied around the poles here. And he'll come back. We see the wood behind home plate. We'll usually... Ricochet a ball back to the pitcher sometimes. Got a couple go off the poles and come back onto the field to play lately. It's rare, but it happens. 0-2, swung on, grounded to second. Vigin to his left, has it. Throw to first in time to get Smith by a step. Ty Healy with a 1-2-3 fifth. We're through five at Cardines. 3-2, Fishers Island over Kettlebottom on the NCBL Broadcast Network. Top of the sixth inning at Cardines Field. Fishers Island with a one run lead over Kettlebottom. We have a new pitcher taking over on the mound out of Westfield State. It's Pat Jordan on a relief of Will McFadden. Yeah, Pat Jordan, you mentioned out of Westfield State, making his fifth appearance of the summer. Two of those previous four have been against Kettlebottom. Make it three of five now. Has pitched seven of third innings, struck out seven, walked four. He did pitch. A scoreless inning, or at least an unearned run, back on July 19th against Kettlebaum and pitched five days later against Kettlebaum. Allowed two runs through an inning and two thirds. Did strike out three, though. So the book is closed on Will McFadden. He is in line for the win if the bullpen can hold on in these final four innings as Braden Dolbasian takes ball one. Dolbasian's 0 for 1. He reached on an error back in the third inning. So five innings of work for McFadden. Two runs, both of them earned on three hits, no walks, three strikeouts. It allowed just the one home run. It's off the bat of Eric Ramirez back in the second inning. 
Well, so it's funny, too, because McFadden pitched, he closed the game, struck out the side the other night earlier this week, and he was wearing number 16, which is Pat Jordan's number. So I don't know if he just forgot his jersey or something. It's usually that as Delbajian gets hit. Tried to turn out of the way that one, could not. So Jordan already in trouble as the leadoff man is aboard for the third time in this one through six innings for Kettlebottom. Yeah, that just haven't been really able to string anything together against uh I mean, you got to give it squad. give it to McFadden. I mean, he pitched really well on the back end of his start here in this one. So Gilmart, who struck out swinging his last time up, swings and misses here. He attempted a sacrifice bunt his last time up, was unsuccessful, and then ended up striking out against McFadden. That squelched a potential scoring opportunity for Kettlebottom. The 0-1. One. one stays up and in. 1-1. One and one. Jordan right now, he just doesn't look comfortable. Yeah, compared to what we've seen from Healy and McFadden, you know, to start out innings. Jordan just haven't been able to really pound the zone yet. Pitch is swung on and missed. Throw down to first on the snap throw, but backs with a head for a slide. still Bayesian. So it's one and two on Gilmart. Yeah, good idea from Rob Butler there. and Was right on the money, but Dolbejian able to sniff that one out and dive back in safely. The back pick can work. You almost have to be Yadi Molina to pull it off. And we've seen it go the other way, too, where the ball's gone to right field on the right field line. So <laughs> That could be problematic. Yeah, Although with the warehouse down there, it's yeah. maybe not as much of a risk. Well, if you airmail it, it could come right back to the first baseman then. So. Absolutely. Or take an even crazier bounce. You <laughs> never know. Murphy's lost. Pitch is inside. It's 2-2 two and two on Gilmar. So Fishers Island with a one-run lead. Pat Jordan working here. Will McFadden departs after throwing just 63 pitches, though he did work earlier a couple days ago. Pitches outside. The count runs full on Gilmar, who is just one for 23 on the summer. He struck out 16 times. Not the guy you want to walk here with the top of the order coming up for Kettlebottom. Yeah, definitely not Pat Jordan, just especially with Jake Gustin and the rest of those big boppers coming up. Pitch is foul to the backstop. We'll do it again. Matt Gilmar, who's provided some glove play out there in the left field for Dave Fisher. You know, struggled with the bats so far in the summer, but come through here with the big base hit. Again, they've struggled for hits today. New pitcher in, so. Payoff pitch from Jordan is high ball four. Gilmart earns the free pass, and the first two men have reached here in the sixth. And Jordan, you can tell just by the body language, just does not look happy right now with the results so far. Well, especially, you know, he let the first two men reach, and here comes Jake Gustin, the guy who's hitless today so far. Tough challenge in stop the order, but you can't let this inning snowball. Especially against Fisher's Island, they trailed 2 nothing early, and they put up three runs, so holding a lead. Gustin foul tips one. That's held by the catcher Butler for strike one. Gustin he is 0 for 2 on the afternoon. Came into this one hitting 381 with a 536 on base percentage. Slugging 762. Homer, five doubles, six walks, only three strikeouts. Gustin, one of the hardest man, men to fan in the NCBL this summer. I think Scott Holzwasser would take that crown. Pitches inside, one and one. That thing about the interesting story on Gustin is he hasn't really played in you know, all that too often. He's played in eight games, started in eight games, but here we are in game 14, so. It's the played, I you know. ideal leadoff yeah. profile for a hitter. He swings and pops one off to the left side. It's going to get out of play. It's one and two. So Jordan looking for that strikeout here. That would be a big first out with Christian Beal waiting on deck. Another tough man to strike out. A couple of contact hitters. Two men aboard with nobody out here in the sixth. Jordan out of the stretch, he deals the one, two. Swung on and popped up behind the plate. Butler, the catcher, is there and he makes the catch for out number one. So Gustin fouls out. That's a huge out as well. It's the same thing basically as a strikeout for Pat Jordan because now ground ball on the infield can Erase those first two men for reaching and get out of the inning. Christian Beale stands in, one for two. 
Singleton was caught stealing back in the first, and he flied out to center to end the third. So he's ended two innings this afternoon for Kettlebottom so far, trying to avoid doing that for the third time. I got a Christian Beal, a guy that usually more than times than not puts the ball in play. Not a ton of pop, but good contact hitter. He fouls this one. Chopper behind the plate. It's 0 1. Well, especially he had some games earlier in the year, and that's, you know, the average could be higher than what it is right now. I mean, just from balls that were right at guys, you know, just like Eric Mira's line drive to Kopak at third uh, a few innings back. I mean, balls like that just weren't dropping for him, and now some of them are starting to, and he's starting to pick up more hits and hits as the season's gone on. That's the nice thing about having the, the batted ball data from the TrackMan radar system is that it can tell you, all right, is this guy in a slump? No, he's he's making yeah. contact. He's hitting it hard. He's just not getting the results. So you can learn a lot by that, and that's why strikeouts, I think, are concerning because it, it reveals a lot about your approach and your plate discipline. Mm -hmm. now, if you're striking out a ton and you're in a slump, that's a little more concerning to me than, than what you're talking about with Beal where he's still hitting the ball hard consistently. Pitch is low. Two and one now to Beal. So work the count in his favor. You well, for a guy like Adam Dunn, who you strike out two, three hundred times a season. I mean, huh? it's fine if you're walking a lot too. You get it on base, but yeah, uh, yeah. at some point, you got to fix that approach. Then it just becomes difficult. Beal swings and lifts one to right. Going back is Ramos. He makes the catch. Tagging was Dolbejian. He's going to hold as Ramos fires a bullet into third. Both runners holding on the play as Beal flies out to right for out number two. Well, we've seen the arm from Anthony Ramos in right field on last Sunday, actually, against this same Kettlebottom team. So I think they've seen enough of his arm and say, you know what, we're not going to run on him again. And this time, they just hold up at first and second. Well, interesting decision here by Frank Holbrook, the head coach for Fishers Island. He's not going to take any chances with the left-handed power bat of Matt Woods. He's going to the bullpen and pulling out a left-hander of his own. So Pat Jordan's afternoon is done. He re leaves after recording just two outs. He's responsible for both men on base as the new pitcher looks like it's number 11, Jake McOsker at a Holy Cross. McOsker will be making his eighth appearance of the summer. He's made one start, 0-1 with an ERA just over six. He has allowed 13 runs, 10 of those earned on 17 hits and 14 and two-thirds innings of work. 15 strikeouts, only three walks for McOsker. He has uncorked four wild pitches, so that's something to keep an eye on here as he tries to record the final out of the sixth. So clearly the plan here for... Coach Holbrook was to get Jordan through this inning against the bottom of the order and then turn things over to McOsker to face those tough left-handed bats in the heart of the order next inning. But instead, you're yeah. going to have to turn to McOsker here to try and get that last out with two men on. And give Jordan credit, too, after landing the first two-minute reach, able to record two outs in this inning. So and it's up to McOsker now, who just pitched on Friday, actually, and that was part of the... Four men out of Holy Cross that pitched for Fishers on them. I mean, they got a lot of them Crusaders. It went Luke Dawson, then McCosker, Eric Lopes, who made his first appearance, and then Garrett Keough, who pitched in the extra innings. And McCosker, when an inning allowed, just hit and nothing else and just one strikeout. So he was sharp in his inning of relief. And he's run into trouble against his Kettlebottom team before, though. His lone start of the season came against Kettlebottom. With only four games left on the schedule, it looks like Fishers Island is treating this like a playoff game. With Kettlebottom, they've already locked up the one seed. Nothing that matters here today will impact them when it comes to the playoff series next week. I should say in about a week and a half as McOsker deals a call at strike to Matt Woods, who's 0 for 2. Woods struck out looking in the first, flat out to center in the fourth. And for Fishers Island, a win here today would be huge. So mm -hmm. they're playing this like every, they're they're not going to hold anything back in these last four innings. So I, I appreciate the aggressiveness. I, I like that. And you're, I think it's when like you manage your, your roster that way, your your team knows that, hey, we're, we're playing a win here. It's almost like you're playing October baseball and you're not going to let your starter go more than four or five innings max. It's even less than that, just bullpenning games. That's what it really is. 1-1, one, one, cut on and missed. Woods took a big rip that time and came up empty. The right fielder out of Bryant. 
So looking for his first hit on the afternoon. McOsker a strike away from ending the sixth. Trying to get Pat Jordan off the hook as well. He's responsible for both men on base. One, two. Swung on and missed. He got him. Butler did not get the tag, so he'll throw down a first to complete the strikeout. McOsker comes in and ends the sixth. So nice piece of pitching there. We're through five and a half here at Cardians Field. Three to two, Fishers Island over Kettlebottom on the NCBL Broadcast Network. Go to the bottom of the sixth inning at Cardines Field. George Bissell alongside Thomas Zinzarella on the NCBL Broadcast Network. New pitcher on in relief for Kettlebottom is Cam Sullivan. Yeah, Cam Sullivan out of New England College is making his fifth appearance of the summer. He's pitched in four innings. And the walks have been the problem for him. It allows seven at six run, three of them earned. I get th three of his four appearances now. I'll make a four or five have come against Fisher's Island, too. So the book is closed on Ty Healy. He goes five innings. He's on the hook for the loss, but he pitched well this afternoon, allowing three runs, all of them earned on four hits. One walk, which is a huge improvement from what we've seen so far this summer. Six strikeouts. He also hit a batter. That one home run was a two-run shot off the bat of Addison Kopak, who will lead off the bottom of the sixth against Sullivan. So probably a good decision here by head coach Dave Fisher not to let Healy face the powerful right-hand bat of Kopak again after that monstrous home run we saw back in the third inning. Yeah. I mean, especially two, three, four. I mean, some of the one of the toughest you know trio to get through in this league. So, I think a good decision here. So it'll be two, three, four due up for Fisher's Island as they look to add to their one-run advantage. Kopak, Coro, and Butler due up to face Sullivan. Cam, the right-hander, is ready. We're set to go. A couple defensive changes for Kettlebottom as well as Sullivan deals. The pitch is swung on, hit high to right. Way back, this ball is gone. Kopak with a line drive laser beam to right. His second home run of the afternoon, and Fisher's Island leads this one 4-2. Yes, and Kopak just continues to flash the power. Now his third home run of the season. Again, this is just his sixth game of the year, and he is... Feeling it at the dish, and that's a big insurance run for Fisher's Island. I mean, that one was just, you're actually just a line drive out to right. I mean, that's what you get with the fence out there, pitch on the outer third, and he just throws the barrel at the ball. And no doubter that that one was going to be out off the crack of the bat. The only question was whether it was high enough. That's off, off the right field there. It's Jake Coro stands in and takes ball one. Kopak's gone deep twice. He had the 434-foot home run back in the third, a two-run shot. He's driven in three of the four runs now as he leads off with a solo shot here in the sixth. 1-0 is low. 2-0, Jake Coro. He's one for two, singled, stole the base, and scored a run his last time up in the third. He struck out, swinging in the first. 
This has been a good one. We've seen some quality pitching, some even better hitting at times as Coro lifts one over the glove of the second baseman Cox in a right center field. The base hit his second of the afternoon. And we'll saw a nice defensive play by the second baseman Kevin Cox just trying to put the glove at the ball. And this one just gets over his outstretched glove. And now Jacor is aboard for the second time this afternoon. Back-to-back -back hits to greet Sullivan as let's go over those defensive changes for Kettlebottom. It's Kevin Cox replacing Nate Vision at second base. Vision moving to left field. He's going to take over for Josh Gilmar right there. Eric Ramirez is in the game at shortstop, placing Braden Bajan, who has moved to extra hitter. Billy Butler takes ball one. Butler was hit by a pitch his last time up in the third. He's also struck out this afternoon. Yeah, Butler is another guy with some power. So you got to be careful if you're Cam Sullivan. Again, it's just a two-run ball game right now, but. Go back to that home run by Kopak. The only question is whether it was high enough out there. It's tough. Those fences 28 feet high. You can hit a ball hard enough yeah. on a line drive that you don't get it out. It's like the green monster in Fenway Park. I mean, if you don't get it up in the air enough, no matter how hard you hit it, Sullivan bounces one. Good job by Cyprian, the catcher, to scramble after it. Hold Coro at first. 3-0 the count, so Sullivan in a world of trouble already in this inning. Yeah, I'm falling behind here against the cleanup man. 3-0, swung on and fouled straight back by Butler. Got a pitch down Main Street. Yeah, that pitch belt high and just only got the edge of the barrel on it. If he squared it up, could have been for extra bases. Looking at his reaction there, he's going, my God, did I miss that one? 3-1, <laughs> hitters count. Sullivan is going to step off with Coro dancing off first base. He's got 11 steals, put him among the league leaders. There's the 3-1 from Sullivan. High ball four. Coro was off on the pitch. So while we have a moment, why don't we take a look at some of the league leaders around the NCBL. We have a fancy graphic that we're going to throw up on the screen. And, of course, any conversation about league leaders has to go to Scott Holzwasser. You see him on the left of your screen. Leading the league in batting average of 500. And now Addison Kopak's pulled into a tie for the league lead in home runs as well now with three, joining Alex Lane and Alex Martinez. And Zach Lises, who again pitched five innings, saw the D-Ray. Go down even more, it was at .064 and out 0 0.47 on the summer. Is that good? Feels it's good. Not, not too shabby. Ball one to David Meach. Hopefully there's a chance we get to see one of the strikeout leaders here this afternoon, Sean Gamlin pitch. As Meach takes a call at strike, one of my favorite pitchers to watch. Yeah. The perceived velocity all-star of the NCBL. He pitched the other day, he threw 12 pitches in the inning, 12 strikes. Yeah, that's. I think mean, at least uh, 12 or 13 streak of strikes, so. Or fastballs, I should say. He's so fun to watch. Coro is off. The pitch is high. Throw down third, not in time. Coro has his 12th steal of the summer. Both runners were off on the pitch, so Butler will get credit for a steal as well. Good base running there by Fishers Island, and they are playing this one. They're playing for every run they can get right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially. Again, you mentioned the standings race before, and just try to make it, you know, not a bulk anymore. You know, especially, again, the home run in this inning makes it two. When you get two or three more in this inning, and get up to maybe a five-run lead. Well, as many teams have figured out this summer, Kettlebottom's never quite out of a game. No. The quit is not in their vocabulary. They're going to try and come back no matter what. As Meach takes ball four, the bases are loaded with nobody out for Liam McGill. So uh, no def no lead is safe against the Kettlebottom squad. That's 10-3, and three, locked up first place heading into the postseason. And yeah, these guys yeah. can hit, hit for a bit. So well, Let's talk about the postseason for a second as head coach David Fisher goes out to have a word with his reliever, Sullivan. I tell you, I think conventional wisdom would, would have you believe that Kettlebottom's the front runner. I think Paul Bailey's is with their one-two punch at the front of the rotation. Yeah, I, I mean, think they're the team to, to watch. If they're, let's say, if they're two in the wild card game and they're going to throw at you, uh, Mike Sansone, I mean, that guy can probably go a complete game on his own. Right. But and then I mean, you would have him theoretically, you could probably get him for at least a couple innings in game two or three if you needed him. 
I mean, Robert, all the stops. Robert Nadal started some games as well. I mean, Tevens can go. Yeah, I like Tevens. Tevens is good. You know, that's the only thing. That's they don't have. You know, Sanso can go a couple innings, but they don't have that other starter. I think, but he's probably their ace on the team. Sullivan delivers a called strike to McGill. The bullpen's been an issue as well for Paul Bailey, so that's yeah. where if you're going to beat him, little, it's going to be late. A little more short on pitchers than other teams. I think Tate Copeland, the lefty for them, is going to be big. Sort of the bridge to the end of the, their bullpen. Pitches outside. One and one. Daniel Brook pitched as well for Paul Bailey's in relief. He's a guy to watch. Potential power lefty they can bring in. Two-way player. They have options. And then this Fisher's Island squad's coming on strong here. As we've seen, they have some power. As in Kopak homering twice today. As McGill takes ball two. Well, especially if McFadden continues to pitch well for them. You know, he can be that second starter to follow Luke Dawson, who's been fantastic this summer. You know, again, he's kind of like what Ty Hughes kind of feel that hey, you pitch uh, really, really well and just the day. So we had a line drive to right. Woods has it. Tagging from third and coming to the plate. The throw is not in time. Scoring is Coral. If it's not Coral, I think Woods' Woods's throw is in time. Yeah, anybody but Coral, I think it's any seeing the replay. Yeah. Cyprian, the catcher, is going to try a swipe tag on him. Yeah, look at that throw by Woods. Beautiful and Coro just able to slide under it a little bit high. If it's right on the money, yeah, Coro might be, be nailed. But that'd be a crazy, a really, really good throw. So Miguel's going to get credit for a sacrifice flying an RBI. And the batter is Jared Grosketh. He takes ball one. Grosketh is 0 for 2. He flied out the left in the fourth and grounded out the third in the second. So it is now 5 to 2. Fishers Island over Kettlebottom here in the bottom of the sixth. Two runs already home in the frame. Pair of runners on. Grosketh swings and lines one to left. It's down for a base hit. Holding up at third is Butler as the throw comes in to the third baseman, Gustin. And the bases are juiced once again. Third hit of the inning off of Cam Sullivan. Blaine Litsky coming up, unless we have a pinch hitter here. And it looks like it's going to be Sean O'Malley to pinch hit here for Blaine Litsky. So we're going to see some probably shoveling going on in the next half inning as well and defensively. Yeah, so this is Sean O'Malley out of Salve Regina who's going to pinch hit in this situation with the bases loaded, only one out. Double play would get Sullivan out of the inning with only two runs home. O'Malley trying to add to that Fisher's Island lead. Bases loaded, only one out. He takes ball one. Yeah, O'Malley who had a hit in his last appearance as well. And a one for three in a start. He swings and grounds one fair ball past the first base bag. One run will score. Two runs are going to score. Grosskoth holds it third. It's a two-run single for Sean O'Malley as Fishers Island starting to break this one wide open. They lead by five. It's seven to two. And that ball just somehow staying fair down the line and even bounces off the warehouse in right field, and you know anything off of that, it's probably going to score two runs, almost like a double. You see some Emily ballparks yep. have the jutted out kind of part of the field, and and that one right over the line, and a yeah, bounding ball chopper just inside the first base bag, and that is going to do it for Cam Sullivan. Reliever coming on with Rob Butler coming up bottom of the order for Fisher's Island. They've pleaded. Four runs already in the inning. Chance for more as the fire engines roar behind us. First, first time this game and hopefully the last that the sirens come in. It looks like they're headed up onto America's Cup Avenue and a new pitcher coming on in relief here for Kettlebottom. It looks like it's number four. So is that Cleases? If I've remembered my numbers. It is Andrew Cleases. I don't want to say Zach Cleases. Andrew Cleases. Yeah, Who's so coming on? Andrew Cleases also out of Wheaton College. Him and his brother Zach, as I mentioned before, Zach leading the league in ERA. 
pitch five innings the other night, Zach did. So Andrews going to come on here. Also a right-handed pitcher making his fifth appearance. Has pitched seven innings so far. 2-0 record with a 5.14 ERA. Five strikeouts, five walks, and five hits allowed. His last appearance came last Sunday, actually, against Fisher's on one inning. Allowed just to hit, but did walk three, just the one earned run, and struck out one as well. So Cam Sullivan is done after two thirds of an inning as we see the fans out in the left field beyond the fences of the ballpark. Everybody watching the action here at Cardians Field. Of course, fans not allowed in the stands due to the COVID-19 restrictions here in the state of Rhode Island, but plenty of fans taking in the action outside the ballpark. They look like they're socially distancing in their respective groups, so nicely done there. Good to see. I mean, yeah, it's tough to go a whole spring and summer without baseball, so you got to get back out there. Well, you get plenty of interaction, too. You get to watch the shared bullpens and watch. There's a, some football action. Of course, Patriots training camp. <laughs> Not quite in full swing yet, but they've got Cam Newton fever down that left field line. Yeah. So Rob Butler stands in. Sullivan departs after allowing four runs on four hits, two walks, home run by Kopak lead off the inning. He's responsible for both men on base as Kalisas tries to get the final out of the inning. Deals ball one to Rob Butler. Actually, there's only one out in the inning, so trying to get those final two outs of the inning. Kalisas deals. Swung on and popped straight back. One and one on Butler. Again, dangerous spot here again. The lead's up to five. I mentioned you get it to five. Feel a little bit better if your fish is on it, but you know, we mentioned before, you know what Kittlebottom can do on offensively, so. Kalisas misses inside. It runs in and hits Butler with a breaking ball as Butler will head down to first. So now He's both. Been on base twice in three plate appearances. Yeah, both Billy and Rob now have been plunked. His brother Billy was plunked in the third, and now Rob is hit by a pitch here in the sixth. So the ice packs in the uh, Butler family household might be used a little bit tonight. Well, I'm sure growing up there were a lot of ice packs used. <laughs> Those two seem like a rambunctious duo. Growing up in North Situate, went to Pontagansett High School. Northwestern corner of the Ocean State as Anthony Ramos stands in. The CCRI product takes ball one. Ramos is 0 for 2. He's struck out and flied out. Takes ball two. Walk here would bring home a run. There's nowhere to put him. So ahead in the count 2-0. Ponagansett up in your neck of the woods up there. That's where I went. Of course, about a decade before the Butler brothers. Line drive to third, caught by the third base. Van Gusten, he steps on the bag. Double play. The side is retired. But Fisher's Island manages to push across four runs on four hits. They leave them loaded. We are through six here at Cardines Field. Fisher's Island leads Kettlebottom 7-2 on the NCBL Broadcast Network. Seven to two, 
Fishers Island leads Kettle Bottom as we go to the seventh inning on the NCBL broadcast network. Here to take you with the play-by-play -play story the rest of the way, Thomas Cinzarella. Thank you, George. Again, Thomas Cinzarella alongside George Bissell here on the NCBL broadcast network. And we've seen some offensive fireworks come out in the last inning or so as Fishers Island tacks on four in that sixth inning on a four hits. And Start off with Addison Kopak home run, and Kopak's had two long balls so far. He's really seen yeah. the ball well at the dish. He's flashed some impressive power. That first home run, he hit a two-run shot to left. Absolute laser beam, and then the one to right field, opposite field power. You don't see that too often from any hitter at the collegiate level. So Addison Kopak's put on a show, and right now Jake McOsker is back out for another inning of work, trying to protect this lead after Will McFadden gave Fishers Island five solid innings. He's in line for the win if the bullpen can hold on. And McFadden went five innings, allowed just three hits, two runs. And both those runs coming in the second inning, one off a sacrifice fly and a solo shot by Eric Ramirez. No walks and three strikeouts. As you mentioned, McCosker came off for the last out last inning. Back out for a full inning here. His first pitch bounces in to Kevin Cyprian, the catcher. One for two days so far, single to start that second inning, and then was brought home in the sacrifice fly, as I mentioned, by Panarello. 1-0. Cyprian pops that one up into shallow right center field. Ramos uh -oh. loses the ball. <laughs> Meech came on and bailed him out. Yep. Oh, my. We, we send the Suns tough okay. out here, and there is a prime example of it. I kind of just ate up Ramos, but Meech able to save the day. Well, they're collegiate teammates, so I'm sure it's not the first time there's been, a, there's been an incident in that outfield between the two of those guys. So good job there by Meech. That's why you come over. Oh, you yeah. never know. A couple of defensive changes as well in this inning. Billy Butler moves out to left field for Blaine Litsky. Kevin Higgins in at second base. Sean O'Malley who pinch it over at first base. And Jake Coro over at third base. Slides over from second base. That's that versatility. You have a lot of options as a coach to move guys around. Coral can play multiple positions. You got Higgins who can come in and play second. And the it's two extra have. hitter positions as well as <laughs> Lane swings at the pitch out of the zone, nothing and two. And What's the word? It gives you options yeah, as a head gives, coach. Yeah. As they, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it makes things interesting on us because yeah. we don't know who the heck's coming out of the game or staying yeah. in the game. It's sometimes they, they tell us, and then sometimes it's okay, where's Waldo out there? It's, oh, two misses. Did you ever play Where in the World is Carmen San Diego as a kid? I, I, I did, yeah. I had the, I had the game. Yeah. It was a PC game. I don't think I remember. I don't think I played it that much, but I, I do remember it. Curve on the dirt. Lane goes down swinging. And that's McCosker's second strikeout here. He yeah. struck out Matt Woods to end the sixth. Lane struck out twice, three at bats in the afternoon. 0 for 3 day for him so far and brings up Panarello. Popped out in the fifth and the sacrifice fly in the second. Gave Kettlebottom an early 2-0 lead. I've been trying to get back into it ever since so after the through running put up by Fishers Island. So at what point do we have to have the did they peak too soon conversation with Kettlebottom? Yes. Because, I mean, they've locked everything up, but it's like... It's like that, yeah, they've started 9-0 to start the year and now 1-3 since... That start. Yeah, I mean, can can you just turn it on once the playoff series starts? I mean, they're in, they're in, they're guaranteed an appearance in the championship series. They've already won the regular season title. They're going to be the home team, of the championship series, which starts next Tuesday. Well, the a week from this upcoming Tuesday, I should say. I want to clarify that. As you see the graphics on your screen, again a couple tiebreakers in place as well. As Panarello fans on that one, one and two. And I mean, the cool thing is you think of the MLB season 162 games. You always heard of a 163rd game, which happens, I think it happened last year, actually. It's rare, but yes. Yeah, yep. to decide who goes to the playoffs or not. Well, there will be one of those here in case the two teams are tied in the spot there for the final seat as Panarello goes down looking. One, two, three inning put up here in the top of the seventh inning. Down and over they go. We're through six and a half, seven, two lead for Fishers Island. And listening to NCBL Baseball, presented by People's Credit Union.
After the seventh inning stretch here in the bottom of the seventh inning, Fishers Island 7-2 lead over Kettle Bottom. It's a little bit different, you know, in between innings now on the going in from the top of the seventh into the bottom because there's no fans here we mentioned before. You know, don't have any God Bless America or, you know, some ballparks due to that. They don't have seventh inning stretch songs. We could do the YMCA or something in between innings, but... <laughs> Take me out to the ball game. Yeah, take me out to the ball game. You know, where's for, uh, Where's Harry Carey when yeah. you need him? <laughs> well, my good friend's a big Cubs fan, so <laughs> he's a broadcaster as well in the Cubs organization. So will be one, two, three here to face Andrew Cleases. Spencer Smith making his fourth trip to the dish. Of course, we all want to see Addison Kopech on deck, two for three with two home runs. Oh, well, see if he can come up with the hat trick. Yeah. You never know. We'll have to throw some. I didn't bring a hat today, but nice. I got one in the car. I'll go throw it on the field. Then. It's technically still hockey season. Yeah. <laughs> season never ends these days. Well, that's why I remember the Blue Jays made the playoffs in 2015 and 2016. Um, I think Edwin Encarnacion had a free run home run game in the playoffs, and they were in Toronto, so fans, you know, obviously – big hockey fan up there in Canada, obviously. I mean, start throwing hats on the field, and hey. it took him a while. I mean, there were a couple, there were a lot of hats on the field in Toronto. I think thinking of a packed out, packed house up there at the Rogers Center. We're throwing hats on the field. I don't know what, new, you know, Newport, you know. Was that, no was that the same game where the uh, the bat flip with it Jose might, Batista, Joey Bats? It might have been. as the 1-1 one, one grounded over to second base to Kevin Cox, who's throwing time retire Spencer Smith. One away oh. here in the seventh. There's never been a weirder rivalry in sports than the Rangers and the Blue Jays, two teams that have literally nothing in common yeah. geographically. Well, and They played back-to-back -back years nothing. in the ALDS, and they made Rudin Gador and Joey Bats mixing it up, and... Yeah, that went oh. on for yeah a couple years. Speaking of bat flips, if I'm Kopak and I send one over the fences here, I think I'm flipping the bat. I don't think you have a choice. It's a it's a requirement. You're legally it's legally binding. Saw Tucker Flint do a bat flip as that one dips inside, almost nicks Kopak on the hands. It's like a breaking ball. They just lost the handle on. What a display, though. And these weren't cheapies either. These weren't fly balls that the wind carried out. I mean, he got all of them both times. Caught all the barrel. That's the 1-0. Breaking ball outside. Black for a strike. 1-1 one one to Kopech. Again, now three home runs on the season. It's tied him with Alex Lane, who's on the other side with Kendall Bottom. And Alex Martinez from Paul Bowie's Blue Crew will play tonight. The 6-30 game against South Coast Health. 1-1 one, one curveball again, just missed a little bit high there. Let's go back to Grease with the call. That's one that looks good coming out of the hand. I just stayed up on it. That's if it snaps a little bit more, yeah. Yeah, potential hanger, though. That's yeah. what you don't want to throw in this situation. <laughs> Tries to go back to the inside corner. Oh, good eye here by Kopak. You know that... Cleese is probably not going to give you anything over the plate, so good discipline there to to lay off. Even the one that he took for a strike, looked like he was a, maybe a little bit outside. Mm -hmm. It was close, but could have easily gone the other way. Cleese is 3-1. Kopak got a piece of it, but pops it out of play. Behind home plate. It's full now at 3-2. and two. Boy, that was the pitch to drive there. Had, it, had the one he wanted. That's what happens when you're ahead of the count, and Pitcher having to try to fight back, and we'll see who will back down in this battle between Addison Kopak and Andrew Cleases. Three balls and two strikes to count here with one out in the bottom of the seventh. Payoff pitch, foul tip of the mint of Cyprian, and Kopak goes down on strikes for the second time today. Cleases picks up his first strikeout. Yeah, give Cleases credit. I mean, he was aggressive. He didn't back down. Got behind in the count, able to battle back. A couple of breaking balls by him. Good piece of pitching. So here's Jay Coro. Now the third base been started this afternoon at second base and slid over to third in the top half of this inning. It takes a first pitch strike. So far today, Coro's been tough to keep off the base pass, and you know once he's on there, he's dangerous. As good eye at the dish takes the ball. 
Two singles so far. Kirana scored both times. Again, Fritz Island scored really just in two innings. Fastball called strike two, one and two. Three run third inning and then a four run sixth inning. And Coral has been in the middle of both of those innings. Big part. Yeah, Kettlebottom running out of time. They only have six outs left to work with in this one. One, two. This is outside. I'm sure they're anxious to get back to the dugout as they have Ramirez, Vision, and Dolbasian. Two, two, rolled over. Out to second once again. Cox with his second put out of the inning. And Andrew Klesis retires Fishers Island in an order one, two, three. Here after seven, it's a seven, two. Fishers Island Lady. You're listening to Newport Collegiate Baseball League, presented by People's Credit Union. So Jake McCosker, who's got an inning and a third so far for Fishers Allen, back on here to preserve this five-run lead over Kettlebottom. Again, 7-2, Thomason's row alongside George Bissell here in the NCBL Broadcast Network. As Eric Ramirez, the extra hitter, moved to shortstop now. Start things off from the right side. I said two hard hit balls here today so far. First pitch runs inside. Hit a home run in the second inning. That was the second run and the last run they scored. And then lined out sharply to Addison Kopak at third base in the fifth. 1-0, breaking ball. Ramirez out in front of it. It's 1-1. One one. So the one thing that becomes apparent when you watch Eric Ramirez is he's got lightning quick hands. He's got really good bat speed. When he goes after a pitch, he can get on it quickly. So gives him a chance to, to wait a little bit longer than most guys normally would because he's so quick to get those hands. Especially if you've got a hard Out thrower, there. a fastball in the inside corner, he can turn over it and line it down the third base line. Yeah, he's, he's got a lot of violence in that swing too. He can do some damage with it. One, two, check swing, doesn't go around. Says first base <laughs> umpire Christopher Lima. <laughs> he had to contort his body in a way that was very unnatural as you saw him fall down just to avoid going through. If he doesn't make that superhuman effort to try to hold up, I don't think he gets it. No. Because it looked like he went around. <laughs> Goster's 2-2. Two -two, fouled back to us here in the booth. Ramirez wanted that pitch badly. Uh, there you see the quick hands again, just able to at the last second, he's, he's there. It's a quick swing. That's how you, you hit that many doubles. Able to just get that bat on the ball quickly. It's choked up on the barrel about an inch as well. And that is once again McCosker's 2 2. Curve ball. Throw it right back up the middle into center field. And Ramirez with his second base in of this ball game. Now two for three. Made a board here with a leadoff single. What a fun hitter to watch, too. His at bats are really, really fun. So Ramirez, he's the home run back in the second. 
And now here you see a second hit of the afternoon. Just a little line drive back up the middle. Didn't try to do too much with it. You see the dog in the background <laughs> running. We see that thing run back and forth. Ball on the left field line. Maybe it'll get out there. I don't know. And then right field side it will go. First pitch, Nate Vigin, and he squeezes one down the third baseline. It's going to roll to Buller, the left fielder, as Ramirez thought about going to third, but Buller got over to it quickly and holds him right there. But we'll go station to station. Baseball here starting out the eighth inning. Back-to-back -back singles by Ramirez and Nate Vigin. Well, that's how you set the table if you're kettle bottom. Bottom of the order doing some damage. Now let's see if Dolbeja can make something happen. He's a guy with some pop. Dolbeja so far has reached base both times. Reached on an error in the third. Hit by a pitch in the sixth. So with McOscar, you want to make sure you avoid the big inning here. You got to settle down. First pitch change up at the knees for a called strike. Only time you go to your breaking stuff and throw it for a strike first pitch. Definitely helps. Advantage to the pitcher on the mound is looks back Ramirez at second. Comes back with a fastball inside corner. Little can hold up. Go to strike anyways. Nothing in two. I haven't seen the dog again, for those of you wondering at home. I've been keeping a close eye out on that right center field fence. 0-2. Oh, Dolbejian flies one down the right field side. That one's out towards the clubhouse. My attention is on the, the important issues of the <laughs> afternoon. I mean, dog's very important. Well, the scouting report so far, he's got... Got good hips, good stride. Yeah, f five covers tool. a lot of ground. Five tool dog, <laughs> future first rounder. <laughs> a couple years, a lot of upside. O oh, two, just missing inside. Projectable well, frame. Well, Checks all the boxes. The Trent Thunder have a bat dog. I mean, we got to talk oh, to yeah. Commissioner Mike Falcone. Can we get a bat dog here in Newport? Put out some calls. Yeah, we'll make some calls. One, two, pitch. Outside corner, strike three. Dolbeja knew it. It's going to make a zipper recruiter joke there, but they're not a sponsor, so <laughs> I take it back. So big first out for McCosker after Ramirez and Vision single to start this eighth inning. So this is Kevin Cox who's taking over for Gilmart, his spot in the lineup. So Cox now in the 10th spot. First pitch runs up and in, too high for ball one. That's a big first out though for McCosker after you got two straight hits to start the inning. You, you want to keep this, this five run lead intact. As Cox flies one high, they're out towards left. Butler comes in a couple steps and makes the grab. For the second out. So give McCosker a lot of credit. This inning could have snowballed on him. Instead, he's able to settle down, get two quick outs, and he's got a chance to get out of it. Lefty on lefty matchup here against Gustin. This is exactly how you would draw it up if you're Frank Holbrook, the head coach for Fishers Island. Well, especially you got your leadoff hitter up here in an RBI spot. If Kettlebottom, this is this is maybe the, the most pivotal lap out of the game now. Yeah, it might be some of the biggest pitches of this ball game, as you mentioned. If you're gonna have a shot, you need to come through here. Gustin takes the first pitch fastball outer edge of the plate for a called strike. And Gustin so far quiet day 0 for 3. His six RBI is coming into this ball game. Mentioned the average before, almost near 400 for leadoff hitter. Yeah, only 21 at bats, but those have been a good 21 at bats coming into play today for Gustin. Also has a home run to his tally, too. That was over the right center field fence. Yeah, if you're a left-handed hitter, you can get it out to right pretty easily in this ballpark. It's, yeah, it was just historically, it's favored left-handed yeah. power hitters. Well, you you got the right center, and then you got the right field side, too. So it was on Thursday, the home run against South Coast Health. This late time call there by Gustin McCosker. Not a fan of it. He was ready to find yeah, the one, too. He's a strike away from getting out of this inning without any damage. So this is a big pitch coming up. There is off a second vision over at first base. Two now in the inning as the one, two runners going. And Gustin cashes a piece of it. And they'll both have to go back here to do it again. 
No, we ball, in, ball in the gaps, Fidget runs well. So if he's off on the pitch. Especially with two outs, you're off the crack of the barrel. Yeah, it's not quite a 3-2 pitch situation yet, but it looks like both guys getting a little bit of a run here. 1-2, hits softly, and it's going to trickle into center field. Ramirez coming home. No throw, he's in standing up. And that will plate the third run here for Kettlebaum. They cut the deficit down to just 7-3. to three. Really nice at bat there by Gustin with two strikes. That's always the challenge for a hitter when you get two strikes on you. Just want to try to make contact, make something happen. He does that, able to put the barrel on the bat, a uh, barrel on the ball, excuse me, and then a little line drive back up the middle. Get a run home. Yeah, that one just will squeeze through past Siggins' dive. As the first pitch to Christian Beal runs off the plate. And yeah, good two strike approach. Now the complexity of this inning has kind of changed here. I mean, you're one strike away, and Kettlebottom now starts to get deeper and deeper into this, you know, top tier of this lineup. Well, from our vantage point, it's tough to see down in those bullpens if there's any activity going on. But with Woods on deck, he's a left-hand batter. You got to figure is going to get to face him as well. He struck him out his last time he faced him. That was yes. the first batter McOsker faced in the contest. Yeah, got a, two arms down there. Two right-handers, one for Kendall Bonham and one for Fishers Island. Garrett Keogh, another Holy Cross Crusader, the right-hander for Fishers Island. And you got to figure he's the closer. You want him for the ninth. If you... One, two, pitch. Outside edge, strike three. And Beal goes down looking. But Kettlebottom does get a run back on three hits. And they strand two men on base. Through seven and a half here at Cardi's Field. It's Fishers Island, seven, three lead over Kettlebottom. Stay with us here on the NCBL Broadcast Network. Mike Webb checks into the ball game here as the right hander from Rhode Island College. Here to pitch on the bottom of this eighth inning and keep the deficit at four. Well, the right hander pitcher out of Rhode Island College just made his first appearance. It was just added to the roster the other day and pitched an inning against South Coast Health yeah, on I gotta, Thursday. I tell you, for Frank Holbrook, the head coach for Fishers Island, he's the head coach at Rhode Island College, so he knows pretty well what he's looking at when he sees Mike Webb out on the mound, and it is not a good thing for Fishers Island as Webb is one of those dominant pitchers in Division Three. And he's made one appearance, he struck out the side, throws, you know, the, the mid nine. he can touch the mid-90s, got a good fastball, good breaking ball, he's their whole package, throws strikes. Uh, it's, it's everything you want in a pitcher that level, so Definitely. if if Kettlebottom's going to win the NCBL championship. You got to figure Webb might be the guy on the mound at the end of it. Mm -hmm. You got to, I mean, he's got that swing and miss stuff with the fastball in the low 90s. And he'll take on here. And I'm yeah, sure Holbrook saw me and said, oh boy, I'm not the guy I wanted to see on the bullpen because you're, you're right. He, he knows. He's he knows. very familiar with him, the ace of his staff at Rhode Island College this, uh, this past spring and the year before that as well. So 
it's you know I I'm fascinated to see where this goes because uh, Kelbaum's got quite the back end of a bullpen. As Webb blows the fastball past Billy Butler, loses the elbow guard on the way too. But it's not just the velocity. Yeah, everybody, get, you get excited when you see not mid 90s velocity. But you know he can he can locate all of his pitches too. Mm -hmm. He's got good command of his arsenal, and that's what makes him not just a thrower but a pitcher. No one. This is down. It's ball and a strike. Butler so far, who has just recorded one EB technically, 0 for 1 in the first, the struck out in the first, hit by pitch in the third, and walked and scored in the sixth. As that one fouls right back to us here in the booth. It's 1 and 2. No flinches up here. No flinches up here. <laughs> we got Lima last weekend, he, he jumped <laughs> on one. I razzed him a little bit. He's probably listening right now if yeah. I know him. I think, you know, I've done enough games, you know, not up here, but just any ballpark. I mean, unless I'm not looking, I just all of a sudden glance up, you know. Sometimes you just get the uh, reaction with the arm, but. Yeah, that's my go-to. If it's right in front of me, I, you know, reach out. And trying to make a play on it. Well, Nick Lima will be back with us next Sunday for one final time at <laughs> Cardinals the regular season. Staple here at Cardinals is 2-2. Two -two. Popped out of play. Oh, that's a good at bat here by Butler, trying to stay alive, make something happen. Let's see if Webb can put him away. He's got two strikes. He's got a lot of options here. Haven't seen him go to that big breaking ball yet. Got to figure he's got that in the back pocket. And when he dropped the table off of Butler, 2-2. Two -two. I spiked it. Fastball misses down once again. Good Webb who spent time with the Wareham game in last summer. Pitched eight games for them. Starting one. 3 2 pitch. Butler turns the one down the left field side, but that one just telling foul towards the bullpen. Yeah, just hooked it foul. Got a lot of the barrel on that one. Just couldn't keep it fair. So we'll do it again. That three balls and two strikes. Three, two, pitch, cut on a miss, strike three. <laughs> Close the fastball, pass Butler. Good looking pitch that time from Webb. That's the thing, most guys in a three, two count. Not able to throw that pitch for a strike. That thing was a strike. Bill Butler couldn't catch up with it. Then here's David Meach now. His first pitch flies that one out to deep left center field. Bill Trace or tracking it out there as it carries off the wall. And David Meach will be in with a one-out stand-up double here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Well, if you've read the scouting report on Webb, you know you're going to get heat, and that time Meach was ready for it. Yeah. Just able to get jump bat out there and jump all over that first pitch. Jumped on the fastball. And now... DJ Perrin will pinch it here for William McGill. Let's see Perrin on the summer. Three for 23. Pair of walks, 11 strikeouts. Big RBI spot here though for Perrin. Takes the first pitch at the belt for called strike. Of course, Mike Webb's manager last year in Wareham, Jerry Weinstein, one of the great baseball minds. Pick your brain about. So that one bounces in front of the home plate. Cyprian shows the baseball to Meach at second. And he'll scamper back. I feel like more times than not, too, you either get former catchers as managers. I've seen a lot at summer baseball, and Weinstein, another one of those guys. It was a great deal amount about catching, and pitch framing, and could really help a pitcher and progress a college pitcher too, because they've been there themselves. We see on this side you got Dave Fisher, former pitcher, George Capen, a former pitcher, Frank Holbrook, former pitcher. Two-one from Webb. 
fell yeah, back. There's that. It's it's almost more of a cutter than a slider from Webb at times, but just take a little bit off it. You get a little bit of movement that time. It's tough to square that up. You saw Perrin foul that straight back. Two balls and two strikes on Perrin. Webb's delivery. It's a little change in speed there. It's full now, three and two. And yeah, couldn't get him to go fishing that time. Yeah. But nice attempt. Or no. Try to nibble on the outside corner. Webb's 3 2. Ball four. And now they have two men on with just one gun here for. Yeah, so this is Kevin Higgins now, his turn up. He came into the game as a defensive replacement. So Higgins sitting in Groskov's spot. Ken O'Malley. Came in to play first base. O'Malley on deck in Blaine Litsky's spot. So here's a big spot for Kevin Higgins out of St. Bonaventure. As flares that one down the right field side out on the top. Sounded like it cracked his bat almost. Yeah, then it was on the edge of the might barrel. Want, might want to check that out. He's taking a look at it now. Oh, I guess it's fine. <laughs> oh, what a pitch. Wave and a miss for strike two. It's nothing and two. Higgins six for 30 now, appearing his 14th ball game of the summer. 0-2, wave and a miss, strike three, and Webb collects his second strike out of the inning. Wow, and see that's what makes Webb such a good pitcher is that when he gets into a jam, he can he can get out of it himself. He doesn't need anybody. He can take care of, he settles things on his own with, with that strikeout. You see why, three pitches. Good morning, good afternoon, good night. <laughs> First pitch of Sean O'Malley is in there for a strike. And I mean, Webb had 100 strikeouts in 76 and a third innings at Rhode Island College last year. Set a program record at Rick. That program has been around for 50 years. I mean, it's, there's some good guys that have come through there. Throw it towards second base. It's Mike Webb put his hand out as well, <laughs> his bare hand. He started as an infielder at Rhode Island College. Yeah, and he had pitched, guy, yeah. He had pitched a little bit, and he came on as mostly a, like a late inning reliever, mm -hmm. high velocity guy who could come in, but he was their primary third baseman, I believe his sophomore year, and yeah, still good hitter, two way guy, and then he became the yeah. ace of the staff by far, literally the best pitcher in program history. I know I'm looking at his stats before, I remember he bat over 360 his, fresh, yeah. his first year, he started yep. at St. Michael's and then red shirt his first year there, and Came to Rhode Island College and it's kind of kind of career just taken off on the mound. It just goes to show you you never really know what you have unless you're willing to experiment with guys. And so O'Malley laces one into the gap in left center field. One's going to score. Holbrook waving around the second man and DJ Perrin will come in standing up, and it's a two RBI double for Sean O'Malley and. Fisher's Island tacks on two more. It's now nine to three. Well, O'Malley's driven in four on the afternoon since coming into the game in two at bats. I mean, what, what an afternoon for him. Yeah, he's having a great game so far. But that just adds a little bit more insurance for that bullpen. It's now nine to three. You got a little bit of room to work with if you Garrett Keo. It looks like Keo's coming in for the ninth inning. So two down in the inning. It's Rob Butler now the catcher. First pitch he sees. And on the hands, a little pop-up first base side. And Panarello couldn't get there in time. No balls and one strike on Butler. O'Malley off a of second base, his two run double just happened before. So that one just missing inside. Four. 
two and one. So now make it three runs in the third, four in the sixth, and two here in the eighth inning. Those are the nine runs scored by Fisher's out kettle bottom, two in the second and one in the eighth. So we're gonna miss for strike two. All right, so we've seen seven and a half innings of baseball so far. Some of the worst swings of the afternoon have all come in this inning. Yeah. I mean, it's just the stuff is good. Some of these swings have looked really, really, uh, really bad. <laughs> two two from Webb. Trying to light the fastball, missed above the letters though. Three and two. We have had some good swings though. O'Malley with the double, Meach with the double. You almost saw in the first, maybe two, Billy Buller went down and strikes hit that rope of a ball down the left field side, but just couldn't get it fair. Outside edge, strike three. And Buller goes down looking, so does strike out the side here, but two runs in between, scored by Fisher Zell. They tack on the lead now, it's nine to three through eight innings of work. Stay with us here on the NCBO Broadcast Network. Last chance here for Kettlebaum on the top of the ninth inning. And they put up, they trail Fishers Island nine to three here. Have to put up six runs in this top of the ninth to extend it or seven to force it into the bottom of the ninth inning as Garrett Keough takes over for Jake McCosker, his final line. Two and third innings allows just three hits, one run, doesn't walk anybody in five strikeouts. So it's going to be Garrett Keough on to close it out. And anytime you have to do the math in your head of how much, you know, <laughs> how much you have to come back, you know it hasn't been a great afternoon for your squad. So Fishers Island give them a lot of credit. They've done a nice job this afternoon and holding that nine to three lead. Keough has been a, it's been tough to play runs against him. He's given up only five. Only two of those earned in five appearances, one start. He's one in three. He's given up nine hits. Eight strikeouts, seven walks over 12 innings of work, a 1.50 earn run average, which is the lowest of any starter on the squad for Fisher's Island, of course. You have Luke Dawson, who's been the standout, his Holy Cross uh, teammate. So let's see if Keo can close things out, and you get the sense that he might be a potential closer in a playoff series as well. You're starting to see the roles take, take form for these yeah. squads. Keo, who throws pretty hard, and he's a guy who could be a closer type. You know, he can hit 90 miles an hour, so it's upper 80s pretty consistently. Three pitch guy. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what Keo has here, closing things out. Yeah. Kettlebottom makes it interesting. You mentioned Luke Dawson and him, both out of Holy Cross, and both guys. I mean, I know the win loss column doesn't mean too much, you know, really anymore. But it's funny, you know, both of them at Holy Cross. The squad maybe two and kind of them. Keo one and three is a 1.50 ERA. And Dawson's one and two on the year, and he's got an ERA, I think it's either just above two now. It was about 2.25, but he pitched seven innings of really good baseball, so it could be just north of two or just below it, but. Uh, Dawson just below two, yeah. 
Yep. Uh, so McFadden is in line for the win. Healy's on the hook for the loss right now. Which is too bad because we have some really good pitching performances here today. Yeah. Right. At least Tig and Will, really good job on the hill. Yeah, Healy I was really impressed with because the control was a lot better than what we had seen from his first couple outings this summer. So give him a lot of credit for battling, getting through five. McFadden was good. Three, four, five to appear for Kendall Bonham. It's Matt Woods who takes pitch high and outside for ball one. Quiet day for Woods so far. 0 for three. Quiet day overall for this Kettle Bottom squad. Only six hits combined. Two and nothing here. And Kettle Bottom was coming off their extra inning win over Paul Billy 7 5. And then Q also pitched an inning. Got the loss, but was an under to run because of the extra innings roll where it's charged to the team ERA, but not the individual. Because you start with this man on second base as Q falls quickly behind 3 0. Couple of overthrows here from Keough. Just losing the handle. So we'll try to, see what they do here. Trying to fight back in the counters, let Woods walk here. 3-0. Pitch over the heart of the plate for a called strike. I think with, with a lead like this, you just don't want to give Kettlebottom any free base runners, make them earn it if they're gonna get on. Gotta throw strikes, pitch contact here. As that one gets past Butler, ball four. And Woods is aboard for the first time on the afternoon. And I'll bring up Kevin Cyprian now, who's got one of those six sets, double and scored in the second, and back to back flouts his next two ADs. So Woods leads off a of first. Yeah, not the ideal start. Don't want to get the leadoff ban. But obviously, you got some wiggle room here. The six run lead. First pitch at the belt for a called strike one. So, a win here this afternoon for Fishers Island. Move them to six and eight in a virtual tie with Paul Bailey for second place in CBL standings. Importantly, it put them a game ahead of South Coast Health at playoff spot. As yeah, runner going towards second, Butler tries to throw from his knees. He's in easily. It's a called strike two. I mean, it probably would have been a def defensive indifference, but since Butler threw down, I mean, I don't know what way it's going to go. But you yeah, know, that's the thing too. It's interesting with the head-to-head -head record. And Fishers Island, three of their five wins coming today came against South Coast Health, which you know if. South Coast and Fishers fighting for that last playoff spot. And, you know, Paul Bailey's now, you know, it's going to come down to maybe head to head records for that first seed and then run differential. And it's it's big, you know. Yeah, the big thing is you want to make sure that you're in that wild card game. Whether the two or the three, it doesn't really matter. It's just you want to avoid being the four and mm -hmm. send home packing. So that's the, that's the goal here over these next four games for Fishers Island. As 0-2, that one gets past Butler. It's going to be a wild pitch against Keel. So one ball and two strikes on Cyprian. So Keel still from the stretch here. One, two delivery. Breaking ball over the heart of the plate. And Cyprian goes down looking. Great pitch that time by Keogh. Cyprian just froze up. Not much he could do there. It's a great spot. Yeah, good mixed pitch. I might have seen missed, you know, ball outside before for the wild pitch and then but comes right back into the zone. Now here's Alex Lane. Pair of strikeouts today. 0 for 3. First pitch, breaker that bends in on the inside corner for strike one. Okay, Kettlebaum did score a run last inning. RBI single by Jake Gustin, but a slow day with the bats so far. Nothing in two to lane. 
Ninth innings always take the longest, don't they? <laughs> they always feel like it. First couple of innings, you know, kind of go by. Slane holds up. I mean, Grant, you got sometimes the stars are in a groove. Or for, we have uh, Blake DeCar, Luke Dawson, or Mike Sansone on the mound. I mean, they're just going after guys. First pitch strikes, getting guys down three pitches. I mean, today we had a lot of first pitch swingers in the middle part of the innings, fourth and fifth innings specifically. Is Oh, Dave Fisher couldn't make the play. <laughs> he, he got down to feel the ball and it just bounced off the wrist area. Jake Cora throws it to the bullpen area. That's when you hope that your uh, your players don't turn into a I know dog into a it. gif. Mm -hmm. Yeah, put that on the team meeting room. <laughs> One two. Lane lays off. Good looking offering there by Keo, trying to get him to chase Lone out of the zone. You got a guy who's, you know, we'll, he'll, he'll chase. He's a free swinger, so I like the idea there. Just missed it. Didn't get him to go. As Lane chases after that one in the dirt, Rob Butler looks back, Woods at third before he throws to first. So back to back strikeouts here by Keo. Yep. Ball was in the dirt that time, and Lane went after it. And good job by Keo getting him to chase. You know, you got a guy who's willing. Threw it up there. Time to go. Now it's up to Panarello to keep this game going. So all that stands between a victory and maybe a little post game lunch or snack is Panarello. Sorry, you said snack time. Now I'm all distracted. Can we get a pizza delivered to the booth? Is that an option? <laughs> I'm seeing the players, you know. I'm asking for a friend. I don't know. Eating, you know, a little post-game snack for the players after. I mean, a, little, a little better probably than when you win, obviously, yeah. So if you were up for a food discussion, uh, my colleague Nick Lima, we talked about all the food throughout the ballparks in New England this year. <laughs> that's, a, that's a discussion for another time. Maybe game two later tonight. <laughs> that's we're just about done here. Nothing in two here on Panarello. Again, Woods over at third base, walk, stole second base, and advanced to third on a wild pitch. Kettlebaum down to their final strike now. Q trying to strike out the side to end things here in the ninth. 0-2. Oh, that one's bounced in. 1-2 and two now on Panarello. So far, an 0-2 sacrifice fly that's played at the first run for Kettlebaum back in the second inning. As the St. Anselm product trying to prolong this ball game. Keo rocks and fires. At the knees, strike three. And Keo strikes out the side here in the ninth. As Kendall Bonham leaves one stranded here in the ninth inning as they drop this one to Fishers Island 9 to 3. We'll talk more about it for our post game show. Stay tuned here on the NCBL Broadcast Network.
right, welcome back here inside Cardine's Field. You see the graphic on your screen. Nine to three, final score, Fishers Island over Kettlebottom. Yeah, as Fishers Island has improved to six and eight on the season. Kettlebottom falls to 10 and four. That's the totals in this one. Kettlebottom, three runs on six hits, one error. They left five. Fishers Island, nine runs on 10 hits, one error. They left six. The win goes to Will McFadden. He improves to one and one. Ty Healy takes the loss, falling to one and two. No save. And player of the game, Addison Kopak. He takes the honors, right? You got to yeah. give it to him I after mean, this one. Two home runs to the game. This is the second player in Newport Cougar Baseball like history to do that. Alex Lane was the other one. So, I mean, Addison Kopak, especially with that 436. You know, Moonshot is our Whalers brewing player of the game. And, you know, you said meant for you got you got to give it to him. Yeah, well deserved. That first shot he hit 100 miles an hour. The exit velocity off the bat, 434 feet. You're going to see that one on the highlight reels on social media. If I'm Kopak, I'm posting that immediately after this game. <laughs> so, uh, big win for Fishers Island. They they pull into a tie for second place. They got a shot to make that wild card playoff game, which is coming a week from Tuesday. This squad is rounding in shape at the right time. And for Kettlebottom, you know, there's a lot of things to like performance-wise, but they've they've been trending in the wrong directions ever since they locked up that first playoff seed. Yeah, they started 9-0 to start the season. Have now dropped four of their last five ball games uh, since, and you know, just got to get a couple wins next week. Again, just one more week of baseball left. You got a game Thursday, Friday, and then Sunday to round out the end of the regular season before playoffs start. So, I mean, that's what you gotta you gotta hope for. Get a couple wins if you're Dave Fisher's squad, and you know. They're, they're not playing, you know, this one kind of just ran away from the middle innings. I mean, just the four-run sixth inning, you know, really kind of did them in uh, in this one. But you should look at the score again. Two runs in the first by Kendall Bonham, three by Fishers Island to take a 3-2 lead, and then the four-run six really kind of just blow, blew up in this ball game uh, for Kettlebottom. Still a ton of talent for this Kettlebottom squad, and I think they're going to be just fine yeah. once they get into a playoff situation. And for Fishers Island, coming on strong. This is trending in the right direction for them. So again, Kettlebottom won't play until next Thursday. They'll take on Paul Bailey's, who will play later tonight against South Coast Health. And then South Coast Health, uh, or excuse me, Fishers Island will take on South Coast Health next Thursday at 6.30. So again, final score, Fishers Island, 9-3 victory over Kettlebottom. Final score, or scoring column, three runs on six hits, one error, six men left on base for Kettlebottom. Nine runs, ten hits, one error, and seven men left on base for Fishers Island. 6.30 game tonight, South Coast Health, takes on Paul Billy's in a big time standing clash. Again, they'll wrap things up here from Cardi's Field. Alongside George Bissell, I'm Thomas Zarella, our whole camera crew, and our producer, Tom Lima. We'll see you at 6.30.